taking of testimony in H-428 and not relating to collective bargaining. Um, John, are you on the phone? Yes, I am. All right, John Clack, he was, gets the gold star for staying home while feeling under the weather. Um, and I suspect that Representative Gonzalez of the bag is here, so I suspect she'll be here at some point. Um, I have to walk out. I have to be out of this, out of here, at two o'clock. But Chip will run testimony after that. So, um, Dennis, lead off hitter, please start. Uh, good, afternoon, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Dennis Labounty, and, and I'm the political director for the Vermont AFL-CIO. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak about H-428 card check which only pertains to public service, public sector workers. Before I do, I would like to give you a little background on the Vermont AFL-CIO. We are 10,000 members strong and represent 24 different unions in over 120 locations around the state. They are American Federation of Teachers, United Professions of Vermont, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, American Feder Fed Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, American Federation of Government Employees, National Letter Carriers, Postal Workers, Firefighters, Steel Workers, Laborers, and Pipe Plumbers and Pipe Fitters, to name a few. We just don't represent organized labor here at the State House, but all hardworking Vermonters throughout the state. Many issues we support, such as minimum wage, paid sick days, just cause, where an employer can fire fire you without any reason. It's just some of the issues that we that our members already have, but as I mentioned, we support all workers. We work on the issues such as workers' comp, unemployment insurance, and independent contractors that not only benefit union members, but all Vermonters. In my 18 years here, I can count on one hand bills that have actually pertained to organized labor, and H-428 card check is one of them. A survey was taken and shows that 63% of workers said they would vote for a union but were afraid of the consequences if the employer found out. Below is the reason why. A number of years ago, I worked on a campaign here in Vermont where we had a shop with 450 employees. Our goal as with most union drives, is to get 65% of employees to sign a card that said that they are interested in joining a union. Once the employer found out that union drive was underway, they hired a union busting firm to help discourage workers to join a union. They did this by holding captive audience meetings, telling their workers if a union comes in, workers will lose their job, we won't be able to give you a raise if we want to because of the union contract, the place will close down. In a goodwill gesture, they fired the plant manager. They fired the plant Sorry, manager. I couldn't quite hear you. Could you please repeat what you said? <laughs> okay. <laughs> 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 Sorry, she's not recording. In a goodwill gesture, they fired the plant manager. Um, Okay. In a good flow gesture, they fired the plant manager as they were hearing from employees that he was one of the problems. After a few weeks, we hit our goal of 65% and filed for an election with the National Labor Relations Board in Boston. The employer threw up roadblocks for a relatively quick election date by stalling on what employees should and should not join a union, to appeal cards that were signed, to appeal the election day as it would impact the production of that specific time, et cetera, et cetera. During the whole time, the employer and the union busting firm brought in employees daily, one at a time, and met with them to discourage them from joining a union. Finally, after five months, which isn't unusual to go that long before an election, from the start of the union drive, an election was held. And as the employees were filing in to vote, supervisors were lined up to intimidate them from voting yes. We lost by 60 votes. Even though car check is for public sector workers, it has been my experience with the private or public, public sector, the tactics from employers are the same. Towards the end of last year, four individuals from the municipality of Johnson went to the IBW local and wanted to join a union. All four of them signed a union card, but the town would not accept them as being a union. 
The town hired a union busting firm which cost the taxpayers money. IBEW filed for an election with the Vermont State Labor Relations Board and it took almost two months before an election took place. To be fair, some elections take place which quite frankly is faster compared to how often it goes. Those four members voted yes. By having a car check, this would not have happened. What's ironic, two weeks prior to the signing of the cards, the village had, of Johnson had five employees sign union cards, and the village accepted the union. In many cases, having a car check would save both the town and union money by not having to go through a lengthy process. And furthermore, working class people should not have to hire high paid lawyers to navigate the Vermont Labor Relations Board process if they wish to form their own union. Kartrek makes the process fairer and more democratic to workers. With Kartrek, you do not need four years of law school to, you do not need four years of law school for a union. Rather, workers simply need to have a majority signed cards and they are a union that day. And as such, they can rapidly move to negotiate a fair contract with the employers which aims at livable wage, medical leave, and safer working conditions. Car check is the right thing to do. Car check provides a more democratic process for workers to be empowered and to have a positive impact on their life. Therefore, the Vermont AFL CIO implores the Vermont House and Senate to pass this bill. Thank you. So Dennis, tell me what a union busting firm is. How do you find them? You go to Google Union Union Busters and is that <laughs> well, right? pretty much. So yeah, what they, yes. they, they just Well what the what happens is that employers would hire them and of course they're experts on labor law. Uh -huh. And so they would talk to the employers and tell them telling them, you know, what tactics worked in the past to try not to get a union in there, uh, such as have having captive audience meetings. And you know, we hear that um, the employers, well, would, let me back up a little bit. When we were discussing car check, there were a couple of employers saying that, well, this will take time away from them being on the shop because the, uh, the union organizers want to talk to them, so forth and so on. Well, the employer would hold these captive audience meetings. Now, these individuals don't have a choice if they, whether they want to go or not to these meetings. They got to go. And so then they will tell them, you know, things like, well, you know what? If the union gets in here, we're going to close the shop down. Uh, you know, you've been here for 25 years, you know, Tommy, and, uh, you know, we might have to get rid of you uh, because we don't need your department anymore. Uh, you know, things of that nature. So this, this is what the, these, uh, these union busting firms do. Do they reach out to employers or do employers reach out to them when they have... The employers reach out to them for the most part, yeah. And these are usually law firms? Yes. Um, so, I appreciate your testimony. This, this bill, of course, is strictly related to public sector unions. Yes. Um, most of your work is with private, in private sector, but still you're supporting this yes. as, um, as a concept, as a, as a I, I mean, it, I, Explain a little bit about why why you would fight this fight. Well, I mean, we, the Vermont afl -CIO, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony, have a whole gamut of different affiliations, and a lot of them are in the public sector. And and, and for years, on the national level, we've been trying to get this passed down in Washington, on, on a national level. And um, even though, as I said, even though, you know, public and sector unions, uh, can, uh, union organizing drives, the tactics are still the same. Any further questions for Dennis right now? Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up we have Jess Krause. Good afternoon. How are you? Um, and this is the, actually the first time, sorry, Dennis, Dennis um, we see him often so he knows who we all are. Um, I'm Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury. I'm Representative Deanna Gonzalez from the Matt Arrow from Guns. Randall Zuck from Barnard. Representative Lisa Hango from Berkshire. Representative Marianne Dimash from Swanton. Tommy Waltz from Garber City. Mary Howard from Rutland City. Chip Troyano from Standard. 
Thank you. Um, and on the phone? Uh, John Kalaki from South Burlington. Thank you for not infecting us. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome. Um, you came to testify here on, on the collective bargaining um, jail with I think that there's an under, a general understanding or we've heard um, the, the main focus of this bill is on municipalities and on state universities. Yeah, state employees. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jess Krause. Um, I am currently the chief HR officer at the University of Vermont. I'm a lawyer by trade. I always tell people, please don't hold that against me prior to <laughs> going to where I actually came to work at UVM. And by way of background, it might be a little bit helpful. Um, just to direct affirmative action equal opportunity and kind of got roped into to HR later. But prior to UVM, I worked for the Vermont State Employees Association for about nine years. Prior to that, I was a police officer in, uh, went to law school, and then was before that was a police officer in, in the city of Winooski, Vermont. I was president of my union there for three years, so I've worn um, a whole lot of different hats over the, the years on both the, the union and management side of things, which I think is a little bit unique to Vermont. I'm not sure you get to do that so much in other places. Um, but I, I want to be clear at the outset that I'm here really to, to my comments are, are confined to the State Employees Labor Relations Act, which covers uh, UVM employees, it covers state colleges employees and state employees. I know that you're going to hear from, from Sophie and from John Berard a little bit later on specific to their concerns or interests. Uh, I don't want to minimize, I am quite certain, sure that what Dennis says is absolutely true, that especially in the private sector, I think some private employers go through great lengths to ensure that their employees don't unionize, and, and I don't want to minimize um, the importance of that. What I do want to say, you know, specific to UVM is those are not tactics that, that we use or that we have ever used at, at UVM, um, and we certainly don't hire union busting firms, some of the benefits that, that many public sector employees, including UVM employees, whether or not they're unionized, already enjoy are things like just cause protection and a $14 an hour you know, minimum wage, which is even higher than, than the legislature um, has, has dictated recently, as well as excellent benefits. But we have four primary concerns or, or issues with the card check bill. The first one is that it would eliminate the, the long-standing and very well-recognized right of employees to cast a secret ballot when they're making a really, really important decision. The second is that this bill would eliminate the pre-election period, which is a time when a lot of employees are having a lot of conversations about what's good about a union, what's bad about a union, which union do I want if there are multiple unions. You know, what should I care about? What kind of questions do I have so that they are casting a very, very well-informed ballot before they make that choice? The third is that while this bill would make it very, very easy with card checks for unions to get in and to represent employees, there's no such similar measure if the employees change their mind and say, you know what, this union isn't working for us. I think we would really rather be with, with this other union. And I'll talk in, in, in greater detail about these. Lastly, um, this would be a pretty dramatic change, taking away an employee's rights to, to cast a secret ballot, and, and I think that there should be a clear reason before anybody makes that kind of a dramatic change. And I, I will tell you a little bit about some of the statistics for union elections in Vermont. We don't think that there's any such reason here that would warrant making a change. Um, first, it's probably maybe helpful to the committee, but you, you all can let me know to go through how the process works currently under the State Employees Labor Relations Act. I'm going to refer to that as CELRA, right, because uh, that's a lot quicker and easier. So right now, if, if somebody wants to organize a group of employees, um, they have to go and they have to get employees to sign cards. And if they can make a 30% showing, so if they can show that at least 30% of the employees in the desired bargaining unit are willing to sign a card, then they go to the Vermont Labor Relations Board or the VLRB. And they say, VLRB, we think that these employees you know, are interested in joining a union, we'd like there to be an election. The, the employer can either just agree with that unit of employees or frequently they may push back on which employees are correct. The stuff that comes up frequently with this is, uh, for example, well, you know, that employee is a confidential employee because they're the assistant to the chief HR officer. That employee actually supervises employees, so it's not proper for them to be in the same bargaining unit with other employees. So those details get worked out at the Vermont Labor Relations Board, and the board then orders an election. And at the during the election process, you know, the board observes. It's held at the employee's work site. Employees can vote by mail order if they by mail ballot if they can't be there to work. There is no campaigning by either management or unions allowed around the election site. 
everybody goes in and casts a ballot, and lo and behold, you know, majority, 50% plus of the ballots cast, wins or the election or loses the election, as the, as the case may be. So that's how the process currently works in Vermont. It's worked that way for, for many, many years. So while we've not had card check in, in Vermont, um, actually under the National Act, the NLRA, um, and that pertains some of the stuff that Dennis is talking about to the private employers, there used to be card check many, many years ago. Okay, So the, the National Act, which was originally passed in 1935, used to originally allow for something like card check as a showing of interest to form a union. Well, both the National Labor Relations Board uh, and the Supreme Court subsequently believed over the years, came to believe over the years, that there were problems with that system and that it wasn't the most reliable means of getting, recording what employees wanted to do at a work site. And most importantly, uh, both the Supreme Court and the, the NLRB have said over the years, you know, we can't get confused that the National Act, much like our state act, is an employee-driven right. It's not a union right. It's not an employer right. It's an employee-driven right. And what we're most interested in is in making sure that employees can make a free and fair and informed choice and that they can do it free of, of any interference. So starting in 1947, there has been no car check very, very intentionally um, under the National Act. So this bill would take away that longstanding, at least at the, the national level and here in Vermont, um, ability in, for employees to cast a secret ballot. There's a lot of reasons why there's significance to being able to, to vote secretly on this sort of thing. Um, first of all, people sign cards for a lot of reasons. So if you're approached by a union rep and to sign a union card, one of the reasons is you really want a union and you want that union to come represent you. And if that's the case, that's great. And presumably, that's how you're going to go vote in the election, too. But some people sign cards because they really don't like their boss. They had a disagreement in particular with their boss. They sign cards because they're out with a group of people for lunch that really, really support a union and they don't want to look bad. Okay, they sign cards for, uh, because of peer pressure and because they want to get somebody that keeps visiting them at their work site off their back or one of their coworkers who's been pushing them on this off of their back. It's very, very easy to just sign a card one-on-one. -on -one. A lot of times employees don't even necessarily understand what that means. They may think that they're signing a card and that means that there's going to be an election at some time, but I'm just signing and saying, okay, go ahead with the election. So peer pressure is really not confined to the high school cafeteria. Uh, and the card check approach does not guarantee that an employee's decision is going to be uncoerced or that it's going to be private. The union is going to know exactly how the employee voted. Their coworkers are probably going to know how the employee voted. The employer may know how the employee <laughs> voted. And we don't think that that informs a free and fair choice for the employee. Eliminating this uh, secret ballot election period, the process that I, that I described at the outset, would also eliminate the period that employees have right before an election where they know that an election is coming and they probably want to talk with their coworkers. They may want to talk with members of other unions to say, well, how has this union represented you? They may want to talk um, with their friends and loved ones who have had experiences in one way or another with unions. They want to have some sort of a robust debate. And they want to make sure that they understand exactly what they're voting for before they cast a ballot. This wouldn't allow for that. Okay? This is, once you sign something that you may not even know what you're signing, you're going to, there, there's going to be a union if it's 50% plus one. Um, so we don't think that that's the best way for there to be a free and, and fair exchange of ideas before employees make a really, really important decision for themselves. And again, this is not for or against unions in general. It's really for a democratic process and ensuring that employees have an opportunity to engage in this democratic process. There's really not a need for this dramatic of a change. So here in Vermont, and, and I've gotten some statistics recently, at least from our VLRB and the, the elections that, that the VLRB is responsible for overseeing, it doesn't count the elections that Dennis was talking about uh, under the National Act, which would go to the NLRB and the private sector largely, OK? Uh, but going back to 2009, so a little bit more than, than the last 10 years, uh, there's been 75 union elections conducted by our, our Vermont Labor Relations Board. And unions won 63 of those 75 elections. So that's a, that's a success ratio of about 84%. So comparatively speaking, even under the National Act, uh, the, the success rate for the last data available was about 71%. So we've outdone by a long shot already under with our existing processes and our existing procedures. You know, Clearly, employees feel that this is working for them. 
they are voting in unions under the secret ballot system, and I have no reason to think that they, that they wouldn't continue to do so. So some might argue that this law is necessary because of management coercion and discrimination. We heard some already about how times when that occurs. Um, never has UVM been accused of an unfair labor practice. Never has UVM been accused of coercion or of management trying to lean on employees one way or another for a union. The last time we had union efforts on campus, we put up a website that's called Informed Choice. It says, here's all the information. Here's a Q&A about everything that you need to know on what will happen. Uh, but it was very, very factual. We've never even taken a position on whether unions should or should not be in our campus. We simply want our employees to be well informed and to know the facts. There's already a method, if there were to be any concerns uh, by employees or by a union for that matter, about poor behavior on the part of managers, you can file an unfair labor practice charge at the Vermont Labor Relations Board. It's very clear that you can't go in and make promises to employees uh, about their working conditions right before an election. You can't coerce employees. You can't ask them how they voted. Anybody who has worked in this, and I think you'll hear from my colleagues who have worked in this for even longer than I have, knows that those are the rules and you don't get to do that and it's an unfair labor practice charge if you do. Uh, and as I've said, I, I can't speak in terms of statistics for, for uh, other public sector employers, but I can speak for UVM and say we've never had charges filed against us for anything uh, like that conduct and in fact we've had seven elections at, at UVM. Um, just specific to our elections and our process, I, I just alluded to this, but you know we have had seven and, and union have won and this is going back to Boy, I think the late 90s was the first time at, at, at UVM that, that we had a union come in. And all but, all but two were successful. And the two that weren't successful, um, there was a range of three different unions, one small in-house union, uh, the Vermont NEA and the Vermont State Employees Association that were all vying for the same group of employees that they were trying to organize. So the reason that that election effort failed, in my view, is because there was infighting among the unions in this group of employees. Uh, and I don't know how that election would have turned out if there was just one group organizing the employees instead of uh, multiple unions organizing the employees. Um, so I just want to stress again that, that the State Employees Labor Le Relations Act is not unique. So while card check would be unique to Vermont, the state act very, very closely mirrors the, the national act. Uh, and its intent is clearly the same as, as the national act. The intent is not to force unionization on employees or, or to make it as easy as possible for a union to win. It's designed for the employees and for the protection of the employees and to make sure that employees get to make a free and fair and informed choice before they cast a ballot. And the only way they really, really get to do that and the only way that they get to feel free to express what their desire is in terms of whether they want a union or they don't or which union for that matter they may want to represent them is if they have some confidence that their coworkers, their unions, their employers are not going to know how they voted. That's all I have. Thank you. So you told us a lot of different examples um, of why individuals might vote on a secret ballot card check. Sure peer pressure and, and uh, grievance with their boss and so on and so forth. But tell me this, Jess. Uh, historically, labor unions were formed uh, by aggrieved em uh, employees who felt that they were not being treated properly by their management. So I, hadn't heard, I haven't heard that from you as a possible explanation or reason why people might vote for card checks. So uh, you know, I, I kind of question some of these um, situations that you propose to us that um, kind of lack, for me, um, some uh, historic, sure. uh, you know. Um, so <laughs> the example I just gave, actually, so first of all, um, you know, e if those employees were aggrieved, you know, to your point, and they, they really thought that they were getting a bad deal at work and, and that they weren't being treated fairly, presumably they're going to vote the same in a secret ballot. If they're, if they're willing to sign a card, they're probably going to be willing to, to vote that way in a secret ballot too, mm -hmm. right? But the example I just provided you, there was a lot of confusion among our employees when there were three different unions trying to... A lot of our employees and a lot of the questions we were getting, they really didn't understand mm -hmm. <laughs> which union was which what it meant, what was going on. They weren't clear sometimes if they were voting for an election or if they were by doing, so if we'd had card check in that, in that instance, right, there was not a lot of clarity around that to the employees. And, and before folks are union, we, we really don't take a position on whether yeah. employees want to be union members or not, but there are employees before they're union members. And, and we have an interest in making sure that their wishes are 
follow that they feel comfortable in the workplace and that they know uh, you know that they can get their questions answered and that they know what they're doing when they when they make a decision excuse me I'm gonna, I am gonna step out just right oh, now so okay. he's in charge saw his hand here um, and I just want to point out from where I'm sitting I see unions on one side there's going to be arm wrestling. Exactly. I'm pretty sure. Right? Are we doing that still? I don't know. It's like, you're really good. That's unconscious. Okay. Who did have our subconscious? I ran it. Representative Zot. So, um, I, question. I may have been zoning out, and I apologize. Did you say where you live when you introduced yourself? I did not. South Burlington. Do you, live, do you, do you go? You don't have town meeting in South Burlington, is that right? No. But you know that. The vast majority of Vermont towns have town meetings. Yes. And you're aware that most of the business conducted there is not by secret ballot? Yes. Do you think that's a problem? Do you, uh, you want to? Well, I'll tell you what, when it, came to, when, it, when, when it came to voting on a $200 million bond in South Burlington, I think I'm very glad that it was by secret ballot. So do you, you, you have a problem with the business in my town, for instance, being conducted not by secret ballot? I think that's going to be up to the, the town's how it works. I think secret ballot would be a better method of doing things, yes. So you have a problem with Vermont town meeting? I'm not saying that sure. I have a problem with Vermont You have a problem I, with I, not using secret ballot at town meeting? I think and that you're a proponent of having secret ballot at town meeting? I think that secret ballot is a better way to record people's votes on things. I think it's a fair way to record people's so, votes on things. And if the vast municipalities of Vermont disagree with you, That's their they would opinion. be mistaken in your view. I'm telling you what my opinion is. Right. Okay. So that, does, that doesn't mean that I'm casting judgment on what somebody else's opinion may be. And secondly, when you have a concern with car checking you, I think you use the expression, um, and people didn't know what they were signing, mm -hmm. right? And you have, this is a, a, a concern of yours. Mm -hmm. And you think that when people go in to secret ballot elections, you have every confidence that when they cast a ballot, they do know what they're voting on? I think they've had an opportunity to be better informed, yes. Because in the specific instance of the South Burlington bond vote, mm -hmm. the news accounts by some of the school board members were, we think that the voters may have been confused about what they were voting on. And that sounds to me a bit like people who don't like the outcome of something saying that the voters must have been confused on the matter. I can't speak to what other people have, have said or thought on that. I can tell you that I've spoken to an awful lot of my neighbors who were all quite clear on what they were voting on. Right. And so if we have union members in here who say that they're quite confident that workers will be confident in what they're voting on when they sign card check, do you disagree with that? Well, yes, because I've heard directly from employees that have been confused in this, so I, I think that I have first-hand information. That doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of union members. I think I said at the outset, you know, what the, the first thing I said about why people might sign a card or sign a union authorization card is because they truly want a union. They understand fully what they're voting for. There are plenty of people for whom that is true, but I think it's not necessarily for everybody that that's true. But we'll agree that the, there's an equal, no, we won't agree on that. We will agree that there is a possibility, though, that people who vote by secret ballot could be confused on an Absolutely. issue. Absolutely. The same way that someone sure. signing the card could be. I'd agree okay. with that. Any other questions? Lisa. To Randall's point and yours, I'm going to proposed compromise here. It's going to seem very different views. Um, I think in today's day and age with um, the availability of information, anything that um, either a union or a company or a municipality wants their voters to know, they would post it somewhere prominently, either on the internet or handing out handouts to people, and they would be, the, the voters themselves would be as informed as they possibly could be. Um, I don't see in today's world how you can be extremely uninformed when you're voting. Well, 2016. <laughs> I should say this. Right? Anyway, I just, I just feel like, um, you know, there, it's, not a, it's not a black or white sure. situation. I think that um, in either case, people could be as informed as they need to be. And I mean, that's not to take position either way, because um, that's all Understood. I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So just wanting to, uh, uh, so you mentioned the informed um, choice um, website, and at the time I was at UVM during that, right, yep. um, that union yep. effort, as you, you may have yep. in that. Um, and, uh, 
and uh, I heard from multiple people um, that that was the most anti-union website that they had ever seen, um, and and so just wanting to uh, to say that that was a lot of the feedback um, from from folks in terms of the the presentation that you're having around neutral mm -hmm. um, information and. When I read it, it was um, as an employee, uh, it um, was uh, very slanted as well, and so wanting to, to just make sure that that that, that uh, experience is also out there as you talk um, apparently neutrally about this website. Yeah, no, and and certainly um, I will see if, if you know the committee is interested. I'm sure that there are other. I, I have to believe that we're not the other one, only ones who have done an informed choice website. I do think that there, you know. Opinions are, of course, going to be subjective on this. I certainly have seen information and stuff in the private sector that is going to, that is very, in my view, would be very, very coercive, right? So the stuff that Dennis was talking about of having these meetings where you're bringing people in and you're telling them they're going to lose all their benefits and they're going to lose everything, you know, that, that to me is, is very objectionable. Um, whether, d depending, depending on your point of view, you know, I can understand why you'd say, well, the answer to the question, will I enjoy the exact same benefits now as later if I sign a union card, maybe no, because that's going to be negotiated after the fact. Now, that may be, that's a true statement, and, it, and you, know, you have to couch it in, and I believe we did. It was before my time there. It will no, and here's why. This is what's going to happen, right? But somebody sitting on, on, on the side of the union might take a position, well, that's awful, and that's really anti-union because you're, te you're telling people that they could lose their benefits that way. Um, so, but I understood that people can can have a lot of different points of view on, on one piece of information. You have to be careful how you present it. Lisa. But I think I need to clarify what I was saying earlier that um, informed informed voters can do more than just read a website or read a handout. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, the time to speak to other people or to look up something else whether it be on the internet or in a book or wherever, um, I think that that's very important. And I totally get what you're saying about the, the peer pressure of card check, that there, it may be like, this. I have to make this decision right now to sign this card or not. So I'm actually a proponent of informed voting, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if that wasn't clear earlier. <laughs> I saw that man coming down. <laughs> yes. I prefer uninformed voting. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been here. I would have been here. I'll do. I'll do. For sure. You may want to be silent on why that is, right? Mariana, please. Can you walk me through the actual process? Mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, you know, when you walk me through the actual process. From the point that in, in a group, of, um, okay, so you have employees working at a place. Mm -hmm. And it's ostensibly at some point they form a group of like-minded people in terms of discussing union, non union. Sure. So at that point, what is the process once once they have? Yep. No, it's a, it's a great question, and, and I think it it's going to vary some depending on the employees. So, um, you know, at at UVM we've had him. Now, whether the employees reach out to unions first or unions reach out to them, I, I really don't know, and, and Do you know maybe typically, others can. So I'll give, you a, I'll give you two examples, okay. right? So one recently, um, our police sergeants, uh, our regular police officers are already represented by the Teamsters. Um, our police sergeants themselves got together and said, well, we really think that we want to be part of the union too. They sent a notice to the employer. We met with them. They initially wanted, there's only five of them, and they wanted their own bargaining unit. And our response was, well, we don't really want you to have your own bargaining unit because that's problematic for us in these ways. But if you want to join the other bargaining unit, then we're good with you joining the other bargaining unit. And they hold an election, and, and away we went. And that was it, right? So that was very much employee-driven. I think that most times when you're talking about a much bigger, because that's a small group of employees, if you're talking about a bigger union drive, um, then it's kind of a mix. So there's a few employees in a workplace that are probably um, very interested in the union. They may reach out to a particular union uh, that they've heard good things about or that they have some contact with and say, hey, I've been talking with a whole bunch of my coworkers and I think we're interested. And that union may then come in and feel out, okay, well, how interested are you really? And they may start helping that group of employees to organize on a particular work site or, or campus. So I think it's a mixed bag depending on how many people, where it's going on. I think, you know, to Dennis's earlier points, it's a lot, um, 
employee is a lot harder to do in the private sector probably than the public sector, right? So in the private sector, I think employees might be more afraid of getting immediate pushback because they don't have the protections that we already have in the public sector, like just cause, you can't just fire somebody because. But I think it's a little bit of a mix. Once the employees, though, once the union comes in and is organizing a group of employees, they get employees to sign a card. And if at least 30% sign a card, they can go to the Vermont Labor Relations Board and say, we think there's enough interest here to have an election. So that's the process currently? That's currently the process. Okay. And would that process change? Yes. So what would happen instead is when employees sign that card initially with the union, if 50% plus one sign the card, then there's automatically a union and there is no election. Thank you. That's very clear. Sure. Anyone else? Oh, Mary. So when you mentioned that there was a small group of people that, in your example, that went mm -hmm. to form a union, you mm -hmm. said it was problematic for for you. How yeah. so? Just yeah, no, it's, negotiations? It's, it's, yeah, we, we already, so nobody wants a unit of five, you know, the, the VLRB, and, and I think Tim Noonan is away today, but there's concerns about over-fragmentation when there's a little tiny unit sometimes, right? If it's a city and there's only 10 employees there, that might be different, but when there's another group that they can go into that's a bigger group of 40 or 50 employees, then it's way easier to just negotiate that one contract than it is to have, now have to go through a whole separate negotiating cycle and start over with a whole new contract with that group of employees. Um, and, and I think that the unions, at least in that case, like the Teamsters readily agreed to it, I think frequently the union would agree too. Sometimes when you go to the board over, you know, so if, you know, a union files a, a, a petition at, and says, we think this group at UVM, uh, like happened before in, in 2012 and 14, is interested. Like in the 2014 election, management agreed because they had already, who the unit was, the proper composition of the unit. At least in the public sector, usually what we're disagree we usually work things out with the union on, oh, you know, if I said to, to Dennis or to Heather or whoever, gosh, you know, these three employees that you have on your list, they actually supervise people. They don't want supervisors in the bargaining unit either, so they're gonna agree. Yeah, those don't agree in the unit. Or, you know, somebody's approached my uh, executive assistant or my my admin assistant. Um, and she's the one that provides the support for all of bargaining and for the chief HR officer. Everybody's going to agree that that person is confidential and probably shouldn't be in, in the unit. So usually you sort those things out uh, before the election. Seldom, seldom is it a problem, though, to sort those things out. Usually the union is pretty reasonable on it, and we're pretty reasonable on who belongs and who doesn't in the unit. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Jess, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you it. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming in. It looks like there was a little switcheroo here, and we're looking at John uh, Burrard, Director of Labor Relations, Department of Human Resources. Yeah. Sure okay. Welcome, John. Thank you. And thank you um, for having me. Were well, you listening when we introduce ourselves? <laughs> well enough. Well right? enough, and the advantage is it's in front of me on the wall. <laughs> okay, yeah. Fair enough. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. I'm, for the record, John Burrard, Director of Labor Relations uh, for the Executive Branch, State of Vermont. Um, so, just covered from my perspective, ninety-eight percent of what uh, my concerns were. Uh, from our perspective, this is an unnecessary change. The executive branch at this point in time is probably 99.9% .9 already represented by a union. And so from the state's perspective, there's really no reason for a change here. Um, but I've been in this, I've been working for the state in labor relations for 15 years, and I spent 15 years prior to that in the private sector doing labor relations. And again, I think the, the high points for us is that uh, CELRA is set up so that employees can form or not form a union or join a union. That the choice is supposed to be theirs without coercion from either side. And while certainly I recognize the horror stories that have been told about how management does business in some cases, um, there was an acronym that management had in the private sector. We don't, we don't have it in the public sector, like I said, we have not had to go through an organizing campaign uh, since I've been with the state of Vermont and the executive branch. There's really nobody left to organize. Um, 
But the, the acronym was always if you were if you were management and you were dealing with a union election that you couldn't spit. It was illegal to surveil employees. It was illegal to promise employees changes to their existing conditions. You couldn't interrogate employees about their leanings, whether pro or for, and you couldn't threaten employees. And so while I certainly don't disagree that there might be some employers out there who have engaged in the, the behaviors that have been brought forward, <laughs> it is my understanding, and I say it's my understanding because I am not a lawyer, um, and don't hold that against me, uh, <laughs> that those would be, in fact, violations of our statute. They're violations of the National Labor Relations Act, and we'd be subject, any employer would be subject to an unfair labor practice charge for engaging that type of behavior. It really is, from our perspective, about informed consent, right? Being an informed consumer. And it, again, has been my experience, and this is drawn from my experience in the private sector, that there are a number of ways that employees sign cards, and I think that they covered most of them here. You know, I will give you an example that I know that one union who was trying to organize employees in the private sector in where I worked, um, they held a barbecue, free beer and free food. You only just had to sign a card to get in. And then afterwards, employees were asking us, well, how do I get the card back? It's virtually impossible without going through hoops and getting a lawyer to get a card back once you've signed it as an employee. And so that period between signing a card, for whatever reason, and the period to actually make a decision and cast that in your own mind without anybody watching you is really the period of time that gives that individual an opportunity to work through all of the questions that they may have. So again, it's about informed consent. It's about not pushing employees into a union, and it's not about keeping them out of a union from our perspective. And this card check change would effectively push them towards the union. It doesn't level the playing field for an employee. It creates an imbalance in favor of a union. And so it seems unnecessary. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, John, this is John Kalaki on the phone, and you yeah. said uh, with the administration, 98% of your employees are already union members. Like, what the, what what kind of employees are not currently union members? So employees who aren't currently union members actually, is, I'm trying to think of a unit that could be that isn't. I would say we're closer to 100%. The individuals who can't be in a union are managerial staff like myself. They're excluded by statute. Confidential employees are excluded by statute. Uh, and temporary employees. And that doesn't include, obviously, the exempts and appointed. But as, um, uh, like at UVM, the adjuncts were able to get a union, could your temporary employees under this new bill organize and become unionized? No, this bill does not change that. There's, okay. a, there's a different bill pending on that. Um, so, no, this would not change that. It just changes the methodology of the selection. Okay, thank you. Randall? I'm not a lawyer. I like to pretend I'm one. Um, I'm on TV. And so the way that I like to pretend is I usually like to know the answer to the thing I'm about to ask someone beforehand. But I actually don't know the answer to this. In the example you gave about the uh, barbecue. Yeah. Uh, and where they were told by union reps that they had to sign this card to get their free food. And beer. Don't forget that. Do, yeah. do, do, uh, would that union actually have standing if there was a complaint file? If it was shown that they said people, in order to get free beer and food, had to sign a card for entry? Do you think any that that, that would be a valid card check it process? Would be, it would be valid. It would be valid? Yes. There's, so, so unions are not held to the same standard as the employer in these situations. Unions can effectively promise whatever they want, and it's been my experience that they do. They promise employees that they're going to keep what they have and get much, much more, as opposed to what I think that Jess was alluding to, that it's factually accurate and thus not a violation to point out that if there's an election and you elect, and you elect to be represented by a union or former union, 
that everything becomes subject to negotiation through the bargaining process. And so there aren't any guarantees about where that's going to uh, sugar off. So if a union said, if you sign this card, we'll give you 50 bucks, that would also be a valid election process in your estimation? In my experience, it would be. I haven't had that experience with the Vermont Labor Relations Board to know what their position on that is. You'd have to ask Tim Newton in that. But you believe that it would, their position would be to approve a union that gave not money, but gave other things of value in exchange for signing the card? That has been my experience. Again, in the private sector, I can't speak for the Vermont Labor Relations Board. So are you suggesting that, um, you, you mentioned promises that unions may make that um, employers can't. So are you suggesting that, for the most part, unions don't deliver on that, that people aren't better off if they're part of a union, that their benefits aren't expanded, that their pay is negotiated at that point that could benefit them? Um, you know, there's a whole list of things that come along with representation through a labor union uh, in bargaining with, uh, with management that um, have historically been delivered. I, so I think that that's a case-by-case -case analysis, mm -hmm. depending on where, mm -hmm. right, they started and where they end up. Um, I'm not taking a position one way or another for those individuals on, on whether it worked out better or for worse. Mm -hmm. this is, to me, this isn't about not having a union or having a union. This is about the process of getting there okay. and, and keeping that um, a process that is, again, provides informed consent or lends itself to having an informed consumer when they make what is a really important decision. Mm -hmm. okay. Anyone else? Hmm. John? Oh, Tom? Yes, I'm, I'm still struggling with testimony. <laughs> so you seem to be working on the premise but a period of time equals informed consent. And I'm not sure I see the logical connection at all. So it has to do with <coughs> informing oneself. So for example, right, we don't vote for president on the first day of the primaries. Yeah, some people do. <laughs> and that is a perfect example, right? There are some people who are going to sign a card they're signing a card because they want a union, that's what they want. Mm -hmm. That's not going to change. And they're going to vote for a union in a secret ballot. But there are others who sign a card for various reasons who may not, at the end of the day, vote to be represented by a union. For whatever reason, but they have an opportunity between signing the card and the day of the election to get as much information as they can to make an informed decision, as opposed to just signing a card and then having that card turned in at some time in the future and having them be bound by that moment in time. It, it seems to me, and yes, I know, uh, when we get voting in here, we can get into all kinds of strange places. Uh, but. Um, if you're trying to make a decision, it would seem to me, whether you're voting or you're signing a card, you darn well ought to be thinking about what you're doing. You know, the process of getting here, to me, doesn't seem to make any difference. So, I think it has to do with how you get there. And you know, people, are, people are messy, people are interesting, and certainly people are subject to peer pressure or any other pressures. Uh, and from my perspective, I, I, right, am generally not subject to those things, uh, and so I would make an informed decision before I sign the card, but not everybody's like that. Yeah, well, I would submit that would happen in the election as well, if there'd be pressure, you give an example. Is it, well, it's you know. a secret ballot, so there's, there's a secret ballot. Right. Yeah. But still, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? John, thank you very much. Thank you. Your time. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, moving right along, Sophie. Yep. Oh, okay. Say your last name for us. <laughs> Zadatni. Zadatni. Yes. Okay. So a lot of people struggle with that. Yes. 
<laughs> and you're general counsel for Vermont State College. Yes, so I am a lawyer, so well, you can all hold okay. that against me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lawyer, not lawyer, lawyer. Right. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to add. I mean, I think Jess um, and John kind of covered the concerns we have. Um, at the Vermont State Colleges, we have uh, six unions. Uh, most recently, um, our CCV faculty voted to unionize. That was our most recent one in 2017. Um, I would echo the points that we've already heard in terms of the importance of um, a secret ballot. Signing a card is a public act, um, a secret ballot. Uh, no one knows you know, how, you, how you voted uh, in the election. Uh, the other piece I, from the questions that have been asked about information, um, if we have a card check only system, um, those cards can be gathered before an employer is aware that there's a union drive going on, that their opportunity to inform uh, the employees um, is gone, um, effectively. So that, to me, is one of the benefits about having the process we currently have, is that you, the union gathers cards, submits them to the Labor Relations Board. If there's sufficient interest, the board organizes um, an election. At that point, the employer is aware that their have cards have been filed and that uh, we're moving towards an election. And that would be when there would be the information uh, period that would be uh, give the employees a, a chance to hear uh, from both sides in terms of the benefits um, of joining a union. Um, the other piece um, in terms of even-handedness, one of the concerns I had just in terms of the proposed legislation, um, again, I, just echoing I think what both Joss and John, uh, Jess and John have said is um, even-handedness for employees is really the concern rather than tilting uh, the, the scale in favor of, of unionization. And one of the concerns I have is that right now, and I think Jess had touched on this, but um, if you use the ch uh, card check approach to get a union in, there's no similar approach to get a union out or to change the union representation. Um, and similarly, under um, Section 942 of uh, SELRA, election conduct, right now the language, and this is not part of your bill, any interested person may file with the board a charge that employees eligible to vote in an election under this chapter have been coerced or restrained in the exercise of this right. So if you go to card check, that, that piece is going to be missing. Um, there will be no opportunity for interested persons to file um, with the Labor Relations Board to say that employees have been coerced or restrained in exercising their right. Um, so I think that goes to the question I know that, that Randall had in terms of um, you know, if you're buying votes or something like that, um, under what you're proposing with the card check bill, that, that piece is missing on the other side, that there isn't that same opportunity as there is with elections for somebody to file with the Labor Relations Board to say that employees were being coerced or restrained. So do we have evidence that that actually happens? Um, I think there is evidence that, um, I mean, I, I, I don't have the first-hand knowledge that John had in terms of beers and barbecues and things like that. Um, <laughs> But, I mean, I, I certainly from the experience we recently had with CCV, there certainly were um, reports that we received that employees, uh, the adjunct faculty that were organizing, um, were promised things that they, they didn't ultimately get in the bargaining process. And then going to one of the questions, um, I think from, from Mike, um, in terms of were they better off, yes, I mean, they, they <coughs> organized, they voted for a, a union, we had a collective bargaining process, and I think they certainly have are better than where they were when they were um, unprotected by a union, but that's not the same as they didn't get all the benefits that a lot of them had been promised that led them to sign cards. And I think that just goes back to the other concern that you've heard in terms of peer pressure and you know people being induced to sign cards without fully understanding when they sign that. They may be told if you sign this, it means you're getting retirement benefits, you're getting medical care or whatever, and maybe you're not. Um, so you know, do they, do they know that? And again, goes back to the other issue we just talked about in terms of giving the employer an opportunity mm -hmm. to share information about what, you know, what what can happen. And certainly with the CCV election, the same issue came up in terms of um, having to explain to people that once you've once you've elected a union, then we sit around the table and we bargain over what benefits and things you get. And I think sometimes people don't realize that um, going in, they think that they're getting the same thing everyone else already has that's in a union or whatever. Maybe. But I mean, it's a continuing process, though. I mean, there's an annual, semi annual, whatever uh, it may be, that um, collective bargaining happens, happens so that uh, it, doesn't it 
go without saying that these progressions might ultimately yield the Absolutely. benefits that those people have been promised? Right. I mean, it could down the road, right? That's true. I mean, you're going to be around the table and you're going to be negotiating when the contract is up. But I think some people, we, we understood that, that people had been promised that and then, you yeah. know, obviously that should not yeah. happen. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah, I think my question was answered during that statement. It was, I was curious what types of things were promised before right. the signature. So it mostly revolves around expanded benefits. Well, but that was particularly for our young faculty. I mean, again, for our other, you know, employees, whether they're in the union or not, they they've got the livable wage and benefits and retirement and all that stuff. But particularly for our young faculty, that's a very different kind of workforce than, than our regular full time mm -hmm. employees. So, yeah. and like, so what's like a typical over promising in your opinion? Uh, well, something like that. That would something be the one like I have first hand knowledge yeah. of. Okay, great. But isn't that part of the? Um, education factor and don't benefits sometimes change? I mean there are a lot of companies now not offering pensions or right. whatever. So wouldn't people most people be informed that this could possibly change? So that's my concern with the education piece because if you have a card check, the employer may not even be aware that um, that a union has gathered 50 plus one, 50% uh, plus one uh, cards to submit to the Labor Relations Board, and then the union is in. There's, there has been no information provided. There's been no counterbalance to whatever they were told when they were signing cards. So to me, it's just an important, again, I would echo, we, we're not um, dragging people into rooms and berating them, like don't sign, you know, don't sign up for a union or anything like that. But um, at least it gives the employer an opportunity to at least point out what what collective bargaining looks like, what what they can expect to happen, um, just so people do have more information. Uh, because if you go straight from a card check to having a union, you go, you've lost that. The employer has lost that opportunity to have an information piece and to have a discussion about it. And again, the employer puts out, and again, going to the point in terms of a website, you know, if the union thinks, well, that's, you know, we now need to reinform, you know, that's what they're saying, this is what we're saying. I mean, there's a robust discussion there, so at least when people then get to vote, they've had the opportunity to hear from both the union side and from the employer's side. But usually the, the union um, notifies the <coughs> employer that there's interest in forming a union, and so the employer is aware that the union representative is going to be in their place of business. And obviously, I mean, not necessarily. I don't think that was no. necessarily true um, for CCV. I mean, there'd been a long time effort to to organize the faculty at CCV. So, for a long time, there had been union reps talking to faculty at CCV. So, in that case, I mean, it's perfectly possible they could have gotten 50% cards plus one, and then find out, oh, they filed it, and now we have a union without having had that information period during the election. Mm -hmm. I don't know that an employer would necessarily know that that was imminent or likely to happen. Could you tell us um, who not who are non-union employees of the state colleges, or do you have exempt employees? Oh, if it's too <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a lot of different. Um, yeah. So I'm we, just curious. So we, well, I'll tell you who is unionized. So we okay. have our full-time faculty are unionized yeah. okay. at our three residential colleges. Our part-time faculty at our three residential colleges are unionized. Our part-time faculty at CCV are unionized. So we have three faculty unions. Okay. Uh, we have um, a group called the Professional Administrative and Technical mm -hmm. Unit. Um, and then we have a supervisory unit. Again, going back to what we said earlier, you can't have the supervisors in the same unit. Um, and they're all of those, those five are all represented by AFT. And then we have our Staff Federation employees, uh, and those are primarily custodial, administrative, public safety, uh, vehicle, vehicle maintenance, whatever, and they're represented by the Vermont State Employees Association. Uh -huh. okay. So, um, but we do have, I mean, there are pockets that aren't unionized, and again, for the same reasons John said, managerial, uh, confidential, um, so. Okay. That's a good picture. Right. Can, can you give a few examples of um, what you would like to, what Vermont State Colleges uh, would like to inform um, people who are voting in these union elections about 
In other words, um, what information would you give them that you think would that the unions wouldn't be giving them? Um, I think you know Jess gave a really good example in terms of just explaining that once an, a union um, has uh, been elected or been selected that then there's a collective bargaining process. So that promises about what will happen when there's a union are, are promises, but they're not guarantees of what's going to happen. Um, I think you know people have questions about union dues. They have questions about what if they don't want to join the union. Um, you know, again, there's been changes uh, following the Supreme Court's decision in Janus. Um, you know, before they would have paid an agency fee, but just questions like that. Um, and you would. I presumably inform them that any promises made by Vermont State Colleges would also not necessarily be kept either. I'm assuming that's part of your inform information I, I haven't been responsible for preparing that kind of communication, so I, to be honest, I don't know, but we wouldn't be making promises. We would just be, we would be trying to just say very factually what's happening, like when the election would be, who would be part of the unit, um, just providing sort of concrete factual information so they're aware of what's, what's happening. Okay, so hold on. Now you would now I'm, if I'm understanding you're just going to inform them when the election's going to happen. Not just, I'm just, just saying that. Because one of the things you just gave an example of was that you would be uh, informing them that promises that the unions are making aren't necessarily going to be kept. I don't think we would phrase it that way. I think we would explain that um, that what's in a contract, what's in a union contract, would be decided at the negotiating table, at the bargaining table. I don't think we'd say don't believe anything the union said. We would be saying just so you understand there's a process. Like when the union comes in, so for example, for CCV faculty, because we already had a part time faculty unit, I think a number of them thought that they were automatically going to get whatever the part time faculty had already negotiated previously. But CCV is a you know it's a separate institution, and there was a separate negotiation between CCV and their adjunct faculty. It wasn't a question of simply just having the exact same contract that the part time faculty already had. And you think that the union misinformed them, or you just? I, to, I, just I don't have personal knowledge of that. I just all I can base it is on questions that came back. Anyone else? Thank you, Sophie. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. And next up, <laughs> Rob Kidd. Tell us here who you're yep. here representing today, Rob, if you would. So, I believe. Yeah, yeah so um, my name is Rob Kidd. I actually work for the Vermont Sierra chapter of the Sierra Club as the conservation program manager, but I am speaking as myself as a, as a member of the Progressive Workers Union. It's the Sierra Club National Union. Um, and basically what I want to do is kind of talk about the benefits of how we see unionizing and car check as making it a smoother process for workers to join together. Um, myself, when I first was hired by the Sierra Club over about six years ago, I was originally hired by Sierra Club National, which I was unionized. My posi job position transferred about a year later, and I was made a, a local Vermont chapter employee, which has its separate books and separate entity. But when I was switched over, I was told I could not be unionized anymore. Um, myself was I had to sign to agree to be switched over to be a non-unionized employee, and I looked at my local folks and I said, I would agree to this if you follow all stipulations in the union contract. They agreed. So I was one of the few employees who was not unionized being represented in any way by default. <laughs> um, so then for the next few couple of years, I'd randomly meet different Sierra Club employees who work for the chapters who weren't unionized, and we'd have these kind of discussions about unionizing, about, you know, it's not fair that local employees don't have this opportunity. And we kind of built that relationship with each other within a small group of people, because I'd be traveling to n different national conventions. And, and our parent union, the Progressive Workers Union, was negotiating with the national organization about uh, their latest contract, and they said, you know, one of the things we'd love to see is our colleagues in, in the states being able to unionize. And initially, the Sierra Club was a little concerned because there are operational differences. There are different ways we handle things on the local levels, a lot more democratic process. So there were kind of concerns on that. And we had 
I think, I'm not sure the exact number, but at least 30 of us who are already publicly saying we are actively involved. And uh, to just give you a reference, there's about 170 state employees for the Sierra Club, so we have 30 of us who are talking about how to do this. And we signed a letter, sent it to the, our national director, um, and the national director and the national president looked at it and said, wow, you guys really wanted to be unionized? And they agreed upon to that process as long as we went through card check. And, and so we went through a negotiation process with Karchak about how we would proceed this. And along that particular way, one of the things that was kind of shocking to me going through that first experience, because I've always seen this confrontational approach, like, oh, here's the employers on one side, here's the, here's the employees on the other side. But we were kind of like, no. They were, the Sierra Club was like, no, let's work together to create the best process. And from my angle, we were looking at this, we don't want to weaken the organization, we want to strengthen it so all of our employees are treated the same, treated fairly, equitably across the, across the board, so that somebody who's doing my job in California is paid fairly for there. It's vice versa to somebody, I know people who are doing the exact same work I'm doing, getting paid $10,000 less in Michigan. So we want to see everybody elevated up along the way and it builds a stronger organization. Um, also, along the process, by us going through the books and to that, we can see where the revenues are, we can see their sources, and it helps us make a stronger overall club. By even as an employee, I am much happier that I have these protection rights. I come into work, I'm happy that I have, I have a policy on the, uh, the coronavirus. And I was actually told if I can stay at home and work at home. There's a policy, they've adopted things like that. It's given me a lot of those for different protections. Um, so I see this as a really good benefit for us being working to strengthen all of our public sector employees, that we have this opportunity to collectively organize and make a better process across the board. Now, I wanna just step back to how we went about with even unionizing ourselves once we got that agreement about the car check process. Internally, we had a group of five of us who made personal conversations with every single Sierra Club employee across the, across the country. And we each had a signed conversation. And one of the things I took pride into is when I talked to somebody who wasn't really supportive of it, and I said, what's your concerns? I'd hear their concerns out. And we compiled every single piece of data about why people were supportive of it, and why we were, they were possibly opposed to it. And even the ones who were opposed to it, eventually, most of them, I think, came on board because we were listening to them. We didn't just take this on and says, you know, we shoved this, we didn't have them just sign up for, they got a beer, actually had somebody bought me a beer who I was trying to convince. <laughs> um, but we didn't do things like that. So it was kind of actually, I felt, I built a better relationship with the employees, and because we were done openly, we weren't hiding in secrecy, and we weren't trying to be um, trying to get one up on our management. We were trying to work with it to improve our situation. So once we actually did file, we had 71 percent approval, you know, and, and I take that as a really good testament that we were each we were able to get 71 percent because I know looking at our staff listing across the country, we have a dozen to 20, mem 20 employees leave every month and within the Sierra Club. So we we're always just trying to catch up to everybody who's new employees. So by, because we had a cooperative relationship with our employer, we were able to move ahead, move forward with the unionizing and not be hiding behind this, oh, do we have enough or are we gonna be surprised when we get to this secret election that we don't have enough people and we don't know about, or we never even had that particular conversation. So that long story is, I felt it was more helpful for the overall organization that we were going back and forth and talking with each individual member. Um, so, but I wanna also step it back, is outside of that perspective with the Progressive Workers Union, the Sierra Club has always been a strong supporter of labor movements, and actually, in fact, we're one of the founding members of the Blue-Green Alliance, 
which is a kind of a combination of the Sierra Club and labor groups talking about environmental issues and about how we can work together to solve these common problems. You know, there's a lot of times a lot of, there's been a lot of animosity with the union the unions about us taking away jobs. Well, we don't want to take people's jobs because we live in this home too, and we, our our friends or neighbors are have those jobs. So we're trying to work together, not work against each other, uh, and that's the extent of it. So I appreciate the time to testify to this committee. I normally don't come into this. Uh, I normally am actually facing a lot of transportation issues uh, right now, and then energy and natural resources. So. Um, any questions? Any questions for Rob? <coughs> Good Rob. Um, thank I, you. Oh. I actually do have. Um, okay. So I did follow your presentation, but <coughs> so you started with the local unit. I mean, you 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 were union you unionized a local Sierra Club. Yeah. So so I was originally. I was originally hired by Sierra Club National, right. and I was originally unionized under their union, the Progressive Workers right. Union, under right. Sierra Club National. My my job position category switched to the local Vermont chapter, so I became an employee of the Vermont chapter of the Sierra Club, which has okay. a separate so, books. Right. And so then we did a process of of uh, some employees who wanted to become unionized under the Progressive Workers Union. And then that union on a nationwide basis, right. unionized all of the Sierra Club. All, all the Sierra Club local chapters. Once we filed for that 71% that approval. But that was nationwide. You got 71% nationwide. Of, of, of state chapters. The national employees were already unionized. The, those who work for state ch chapters, the Sierra Club, okay. we, we, we got 71% we got of our total staff. Okay. And so they're like, there's there's a couple different entities within the Sierra Club, and that is like the national employees were already unionized, and the local like there's a chapter in New Hampshire, there's okay. one employee right. there, okay. Massachusetts there's six employees there, um, and then okay. Michigan there's like thank you, 13, I understand so, that yeah. better now. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Robin. Yep, yeah. thank you. So. Um, before we do move on, Damien, are you here for a walkthrough on this bill? Is I don't uh, see you on the schedule. We've had one. Yeah, you've you had have, one yeah. already. I'm just here. You're just here as okay to to listen in and okay and if there are questions from Great. the committee. Great. Remind me of your name again. Heather, 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 Heather. Yeah. Okay. Heather would like to have a few uh, make a few comments. And Heather, introduce yourself if you would, please. Yeah. Even though you've been here before. Uh, Heather Reamer, AFT Vermont. Um, it's very interesting, obviously, to sit here and listen to employers who um, our union has uh, organized in, in, this, in the workplace and bargain with um, say how great they are. And sometimes they're great, sometimes not so great, but I'll just tell you this, bosses could change any day of the week. And so even if, uh, you know, employers work here today saying we won't, do any union busting today, it doesn't mean they won't do it tomorrow. Um, and I think they've painted an overly glossy picture of organizing drives in the past. Um, while we were here, I texted someone who was um, the lead organizer at UBM when, um, um, when uh, the service and maintenance folks were organizing. Um, she said they had a whole list of unfair labor practice charges they could have filed against the employer. I'll tell you what, on most campaigns, there's a list of ULPs. Unions don't always file them. We don't file them when we win, right? Because we, it holds up the election. So the employer, you know, we sign up 60, 70% of folks. We barely win an election. We don't file the unfair labor practice charges, partly also because generally the remedy is a posting on the wall and the damage is done. Very, very, very rarely do you get another election. And often, again, even if you got another election, you might not win it because so much uh, damage has been done. Uh, and I'll just give you an example from the UVM campaign. Bosses walked the most vulnerable people to the elections and made sure they voted. Walked with them to the election. So your supervisor walking with someone who doesn't speak English very well, right? Maybe with the vote no pin on the boss's lapel, taking them to the polls. Lisa, yeah. Um, is this factual coming from you, or is this just 
hearsay coming from someone else because yeah. I I'm here to learn about card check. Yeah. I'm not here to hear accusations against organizations who are unionized. So if you don't mind, if that's not out of line, to ask to scale this back a little bit. Mm -hmm. and I, I, will, I, will say, I will say I will say on many campaigns, not that particular one, where we had a whole list of unfair labor practice charges that we did not file because um, because we won the election. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, yeah. question. Yeah. If you won the election. How does that make a difference as to whether or not there were unfair labor practices? Why would you not have wanted to pursue that to prevent it from ever happening again anywhere else? One, it, it delays bargaining, so we have to sit down and bargain. And two, again, the penalties are posting, generally posting on the wall. So so if you could stick to the yeah, card check. Absolutely. Yeah, so so there is there is a tremendous power imbalance. And so the bigger picture is a tremendous power imbalance between the employers and the employees who want to have a union. And so card check is one way to ameliorate that balance. Um, and I, I do want to talk against specifically things. Um, I heard someone say there's no card check under the National Labor Relations Act. That's not true. I know people who have organized through card check under the National Labor Relations Act. The workers at Hunger Mountain Co-op, in fact, had a card check process. And they were private sector employees organized under the NLRA. Can you just clarify, though, that that's a mutual with those employees? Agree. Uh, I identify yourself in the I'm sorry. Just yes, Krause, again, for the record. I, I think that that's true if the employer, with mutual agreement. But it's not one side. It, it I, I just is true with the employer's agreement. But, it, but I believe the testimony I heard is that it was not allowed under the NLRA. Okay. Um, I would also say that this bill, when there are multiple unions, card check is not in process. So I think any discussion when there's multiple unions um, seeking to represent one group of employees, if, if this bill were passed, it would still go through an election process. So this bill does not change that. Um, I do want to talk about you know these informed consent websites. Uh, Lisa? Sorry, yeah. could I ask Damien to clarify that if there, if this bill went into effect? With multiple unions seeking to unionize, there could be no card check? So what this bill says is that if you get 50% plus one of the signatures, uh, you get certified. Presumably, if there are multiple unions, you could end up in a situation where each union, you have three unions getting 30%, mm -hmm. for example, or two unions getting 40%. It is still conceivable that you could have one union that gets 60% and then is certified at card check there. But, um, okay, so and this, yeah. this bill would allow 50% plus one, but if there's division between them mm -hmm. and none of them can get mm -hmm. a, a um, not a plurality, but a majority, <laughs> sorry, I. Right, so that, thank you. I needed that clarification yeah, because your yeah. statement didn't yeah. lend me to understand that. I appreciate thank that, you. thank you. Um, and I, I would just say, you know, I have always been taught that unions promising things is an unfair labor practice charge. Uh, if, if I had an organizer working for me who was making promises to workers, uh, they, would, they would be pulled aside and, and told to stop because it is, um, my understanding is it is illegal. Uh, and we don't do that. Um, sorry, I'm looking at so, and I, and I do want to talk about CCV faculty a lot because that one came up a bunch. And both of those, uh, both those, or, there was two organizing drives, both with our union, AFT, one was before my time, one after. Um, and the first drive, it was a different administration, and um, there was more an, anti union activity, and the union lost. The second time around, uh, there was less. Uh, employer-sponsored anti-union activity, and the union did win that election. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I, this whole thing about the union promising things, I, again, I think is um, we don't do that. We tell people uh, the only thing that we promise is you get the right to bargain, right? You get the right to negotiate. That's what you get when you form a union. We cannot guarantee the outcome of any um, of any um, contracts. And I, I just, well, maybe I'll just stop right there. Um, 
But again, you know, I feel some of these informed consent websites, we could have a long discussion about them, but often there are, we have the employer answering things that the unions could best answer. And, you know, look, we all can write things that slant things in one direction or another. Um, and generally, I have yet to see one that says, oh, on average, when unions organize, uh, workers make more money. On average, when unions organize, these good things happen. So one can find one, I'll be happy, but I've never seen them and I've seen quite a few of them. So, um, you know, obviously we think this is good public <coughs> policy. Um, we think that uh, uh, card check has been done, uh, it can be done, but right now it is true, you need the employer's consent. And most employers are not gonna consent to it, um, which is why we support this one. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Yes. Any questions? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> You're saying employers wouldn't consent to it. Do you have data on that? On Every campaign that we've ever run, we have asked the employer to voluntarily recognize um, recognize the union. I'm not sure it's allowed under CELRA. I, I just want to say it is allowed under the National Labor Relations Act. It is allowed under the Teachers and Municipal Act. And so the NEA can tell you about a number of times that they've asked for voluntary recognition and gained it. I believe that under Selver, which is the state employees, uh, which, and UVM and VSE, even if the union asks for it, I don't, and I'm seeing some nods over here. I would agree. We actually yeah. had an instance with the AFT. Please where, identify yourself. Uh, yourself. This is Sophie Zidani, general counsel for the Vermont State Colleges, and we did have a situation where um, uh, we, were, we were prepared to move forward voluntarily, and we were told by the Labor Relations Board that we could not under Selver. Okay. So, so anyway, so we, outside of CELRA, our union has always, and the union I was with before was mostly private sector, you know, would ask the union to voluntarily represent, uh, uh, um, voluntarily recognize the union based on the majority of the workers supporting, and they've said no, except for Thunder Mountain. Uh, Demian, yes. Add a little piece to that. As, as far as I know, the one collective bargaining, public sector collective bargaining law in Vermont that allows voluntary recognition expressly is the teacher and um, administrators labor relation act for public school teachers um, and that is i believe included in this bill uh, with a card check option but that's the only one where there's an express description of the process there of a process for a timeline for the the school board to decide whether or not to voluntarily recognize or request an election um, and that it's a different process than is set forth under the State Employees Act and the Judiciary Employees Act where there's a petition that's submitted to the Labor Board who reviews the petition and then decides uh, if it's an appropriate, appropriate to hold an election there. And they may settle issues such as disputes over the bargaining unit and so forth um, prior to that election. Okay. Can I identify yourself for record? I'm sorry, Damian Leonard, Legislative Council. Thank you. Take that conversation as we confess it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it was fun. We confess. I do a little refereeing, but that's okay. <laughs> Put your box and box down. It was good. I didn't want to say it. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi again, John. Okay. Sure. We're on the record. Um. Tiana and Matt are uh, you. We're just out on break. Yeah, we took a break. <laughs> okay. Um. Which one? Yeah. What are the arguments? Not in the immediate hallway. That's fine. Thank you, Mike. Um, so, if um, what is the is that optional resolve language? Mine? Yes. No, sir. Oh Until no. Okay. Um, all right. So I shared I shared um, information over the weekend on this bill. Um, we have heard from a couple of different corners where um, in some cases there is a desire to have some stronger language and um, basically 
uh, I used Rich, I, I have some language that I'm going to have Ron put up as soon as he comes back in. That is additional language. In the resolves of the whereas. In the whereas. Oh, for the record, it's Michael Turner, legislative council. Um, I received immediate feedback on what I sent out from Representative Todd and Hango and Walls. And um, I, mean, I personally had conversations over town meeting break at town meeting with folks who um, who kept asking us to do, you know, to do have a little bit stronger language in what we're trying to do. And what we're getting at was, um, Ron, could you just put up the language? So Rich Holshue, Michael, I don't know if you saw it from the last time we talked about this, but Rich Holshue from Brattleboro was not able to make the testimony, he provided some written testimony. And, um, Which I think was part of the source for the second result. So this was language that some of this sort of exists. Um, if I can make one comment, and we had talked about saying eugenics and not eugenical earlier. Sure. In terms this of this was, yeah. yeah. Um, so the these, these two were based on um, my intention with this language was to put it in to, I believe, this after the second existing whereas. Chair, uh, are we looking at the optional resolve language, or are you all looking at that so I can be looking at the same thing? Uh, no, John, it's the language I sent to you an hour or so ago. Okay, okay, I, I, I have that now. I, all right, I'm with you, thank you. How did you share that with us? I'm sorry, I must have missed that. I'm sharing this with the committee as a whole right now. I sent it to John just a while ago. So how are we receiving it? Just by reading it up there? Yeah, this can be posted onto our website. Some of this, but not all of this, is in the first reason. Part of the second, no, parts, of the, parts of it are already in here, the reference to French Canadian mixed race, persons with disabilities, etc and parts of it aren't. Right, it's an expansion of that, and then the third, the, the second whereas on this page is, I believe, is new language. So in other words, what you're asking is that I take the, well, I think you probably want to leave at least part of the first one. In I, I'm sorry, I gotta, I'm sorry, let me, let me, I gotta pull it up, I can't, I've gotta pull it up on my computer to be able to be clear, to be, because I'm, I usually try to keep each resolve clause as one sentence, but so I can do that by a semicolon, that's fine. And same as each whereas clause. So this looks like um, the first whereas on the screen would replace the first whereas that's now. No, so this would re this would replace the this would replace the third whereas. Third. Whereas. Whereas. Okay. On line 18 on the current draft. Oh, I see. Whereas this is Oh, I see where you are. <clears throat> All right. And then, then that second whereas on that page would become the fourth one. And then we pick up with line where what's on line 20. So 18 and 19 would be, would be replaced with, um, the first whereas, the mm -hmm. and then line, and then the next whereas would be inserted before what's on line 20. My one comment, if I may, on purely drafting, not addressing the substance <coughs> at all here, but I would, in that first, I would use, you, Eugenics as opposed to eugenical in the first whereas clause. Yeah, that's, that's fine. And Ron, actually, Ron, at, at, after this conversation, you can post this on, on the website. But this is almost taken, this is taken almost um, pretty closely directly from the, um, the first one. It's taken from Rich Holshue's <coughs> comments in his 
in his written testimony. And the second one, um, the second one, actually, the first, the first phrase in that is line 18 and line 19. Yeah. Right. So that's that. That is that. that Voluntary consent. So right. you're just adding to that. For the express yes. purpose of protecting. Exactly. So this line, this next line here, came from. Um, I believe this this came from um, some of the reading that I sent. Uh, it was either Guardiola's or um, or Aves, where it was. This is a quote from Henry Perkins. This is something that he said in the in well in, in justifying the policy. I don't know that the average person is going to understand the meaning of that, and just to throw that out there. Which part is it? The, the, the add-on to after fully informed voluntary consent for the express purpose, and then this part of protecting the so-called old stock by keeping the soil of their seed bed, et cetera, et cetera, rich, mellow, and weed free. I don't know that someone reading that, if they understand it right. Yeah. If I may, on a get on a word when we <laughs> talked about the term so called, mm -hmm. it's rather colloquial for a resolution. I mean, if you want to leave it, that's your call. But if we could, you know, we had talked earlier, I remember we in one place used the word alleged as opposed to old, to so called. Yeah. I just ra I raise that as a, not again mm -hmm. substantively, but just as a mm -hmm. word choice issue. Well, I, this is John. I, I, I think it's actually Henry Perkins said that. We have him earlier in oh, the. Um, if it's his quote, then we leave it. So we could just say to protect what Henry Perkins called. Because if that's what he said, I mean, yeah. I'm recording the right person. So it's not so called, it's not alleged. It's, it's, and we mentioned him in line nine of this. What I'm looking at, though, Representative, is the quote. You know, just the so-called, that's not in quotes. The no, I, 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 I'm, such, I'm hearing Lisa, uh, and what I'm saying is if Henry Perkins actually said that, then we should put him in there and say that. I yeah. agree. If, if you're going to quote somebody, you should name him. Except who I don't have documentation, per se, saying that he actually said that. I'll find it. Send it to you. Yeah, and I need it. My editor's going to ask for it, and I would also ask for it as well. I don't even need the editor's requesting it. I'm, a, if I'm going to say that per, in any resolution, the person X said ABC. I need to see some documentation. The person X said yeah, ABC. Yeah, that's fine. I can I can I can find that for you. But I think it's an important thing that you know what's what's important in the in the comments about the soil of their seed bed is that it's it's. It's an incredibly racist thing to say. <laughs> and that's what we sold this policy on. It was an incredibly racist thing. People Can you weeks. explain why that's not that why that's racist and not just discriminatory in general? Towards towards the people who are being affected by this policy? Soil of their seed bed? Rich, mellow, and weed free. We want to keep these people out of our garden. Right, but why is that racist? Because this also pertains to disabled folks. I'm not understanding the racist. Oh, well, it's ableist connection. then, too. So it's racist and ableist. I, 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 it is a, I see a, the racism. Yeah, I, awful, yeah, like, awful I get that, but it's not just racist. Right, it's, 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 it's hideous. Yeah. Mm. Anyway. Well, if Tom says that it's from Henry Perkins, if you, can you just... No. I don't. Uh, you have to I will, yeah. uh, Michael, I will find it right. and send it to you. So you okay. But I'm just it. answering Representative uh, Kalaki's question that whenever yeah. I say person X said item X, I need to see some documentation yeah. that yeah. person X actually saw it. Okay. And that goes even as far as uh, if it were President Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address, <laughs> which is easy enough to document, but I'm just right. using that as an example. Yeah. It's just yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so, 
So these were this is what I came up with over break after town meeting, and then adding in the resolved. I think one of the things that was made clear in the testimony that we received, especially from Louise, was that they feel that in the first result, okay, that they feel that. Damages that were done back then continue to continue to reverberate through their lives today. So that would be that would like be added, perhaps. I'm just fifteen ish after the result by the Senate and House of Representatives. Since we really we already have that in line eighteen and nineteen. Yeah, part of that's in. I think if you want to expand, yes. it should be in the second resolve, not the first. Because right now you have addressed the continuing impact of state sanctioned eugenics policies and practices. Right, yeah. Yeah, it would, that would be. Um, well, the, the question that, for that the question for that language is the second resolve says recognizes that further legislative action should be taken to address the continuing impact of state sanctioned and eugenic policies and practices, which is different than, um, uh, we can rewrite on line 15, their families who were harmed and, con um, and continue to be harmed is actually the only new language there, because then it would pick up with as a well, result of the state the sanctioned. Well, then it is not there. Oh, right, right. yeah, yeah. So you want that in at, at 1560? I'm putting it out there for conversation. I mean, this, I mean, yes, I, 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 I would like this language to be included in this. I think it makes this bill stronger. It makes mm -hmm. this, you know, when I when I listen to the when I listen to the reporting and the conversation on the Krista Tippett um, podcast, where where the United States inserted a larger apology inside of the defense appropriation bill in 2009 and never read it and said there were problems on both sides and just really managed it poorly um it kind of got raised my hackles a little bit that we've gone so far down a path of trying of getting this to be as strong as we possibly can and um and this is what this is what i came up with after town meeting after talking to folks who who were affected um, yes, Lisa. So I don't know if everybody read the email chain, but I chimed in that I spoke at four town meetings about this, and um, in the heart of the Abenaki Nation, really, which is my district, um, and no one questioned anything negatively or positively. So um, <clears throat> that being said, did you want to use harmed twice in the same sentence? Families who were harmed and continue to be harmed, or would you go for continue to be affected by? Because I don't know that we're um, deliberately or, or even not deliberately harming people today. We have a lot of laws in place that we shouldn't be harming people today. And yes, they're being affected by things that happened to their ancestors and their family members, but I don't know if harmed is the correct term. Well, if I may, just in a, a writing perspective again, the way I saw this is I've been merging the two, so the word harmed would only appear once. Yes. Okay. It'd so be we're consolidating the stronger elements into the existing language but those elements that are already there would be left alone and just merged together. So how would you word that families who were harmed and continue to be as a result of? I'm not sure how you would Families who are or continue to be harmed, something that along that line. So the word harm would only who are or can, and continue to be, or were and continue to be. I want to go back and yeah, I, that a bit. I, I just feel that saying that we are continually harming people is a 
it's not our intent to continually harm I'm, people. If it's if effective, if effective is, is the right word, then so I be don't it. Know. You know? I'm not sure. I just feel like we're we're apologizing for continuing to harm people. It's as if we haven't done anything yet. I think and we have done we are doing something. The way I'm hearing that is that we have heard that the harm does continue with a hundred and one year old um, uh, Abenaki woman who um, is still afraid to be identified as a tribal person. Um, so whether we intend for it to happen or not, or whether we consciously keep doing it, I think it exists. That's, that's where I think. Point taken, but I'm still not in 100% agreement. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So I, th I think maybe um, the difference lies in the fact that harm was con committed, and for those people who are still with us, that harm still exists mm -hmm. from then. Mm -hmm. But we're not continuing in terms of new, mm -hmm. doing new things to continue to I'm to, not sure that that harm. phrase says that we continue to, though. I mean, well, when you say kill, you harm and then and continue, it's not in there yet. I mean, it's not the way in which it would be phrased, but it would sound as if harm was committed and continues to be. Well, so that, it, and, and maybe it's the way you maybe well, it's continues the way you read to exist. It. Maybe. maybe it's no, it's a twelve. That's a tricky thing, right? We're we're apologizing for. I mean, this has been well. Which, which well, still has a present effect on some people. Right. Whose mm -hmm. families and individuals have experienced this. But we're not continuing that kind of behavior on members of the tribe who were not subjected, they themselves were not subjected to, except for those people who were. But you've got new generations, in other words. So you've got the generations coming forth that have not, they've experienced the history. Well, let's say they've learned the history from the elders, but they themselves have not been subjected to the kind of treatment that their elders were subjected to. I guess that's no, not the specific, it. not the specific treatment, right? Not right. a vasectomy, not a sterilization, mm -hmm. but that it was, but that the the result of it being like it has a the result of what happened. Yes. Chief Stevens testified, and she he wasn't the only one. Right. That his family, when someone came to the door. People walked away, or people went in. People went away. There was the fear of being separated, right. mm -hmm. which is something that is spoken to as a history that existed prior to the eugenic right. survey. But the racism, if you will, or the institutional, the fear of what someone who drives up into your yard. But does, does that does that fear exist? Today. Yes, that was testified to by a number that of our folks. same fear? Yes. 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 So what? Tommy and then Lisa. Yeah. Okay, I, 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 I think we just have to figure out what the language is. And I've got a suggestion. Yeah, I, well, let, let, me, let me just throw my ideas, if I may. Um, that I'm looking at what well, lines 14, 15, 16, right, is what we're talking about right now. Mm -hmm. The resolution. Yes. Okay. And so, and then the the other language. Um, so, regret to all individual providers of the families who were impacted. Yeah, absolutely. Wait, 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 and continue to be harmed as a result of discredited state sanctions, eugenic policies, and practices. I would harmed reverse it too. What? Yeah, that's my suggestion. I would reverse it. Yeah. My wording would be their families who were harmed and who continued to, to be, be impacted. negatively right. I impacted think, yeah, I think yes. as yes. a result. Is really what is to your point, I think, Lisa. Okay. And Ariana. Yes, yeah. absolutely, okay. because I don't mean to negate yeah. that okay. people are Understood. feeling yeah. things today. Yeah. Absolutely right. not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, feeling things. 
Check that one. Thank, Thank you, James John. John. <laughs> what if, if, I, if I may, Mr. Chair, I was just playing with language here, but I was wondering if the word residual should be there somewhere, possibly, about a residual effect or a residual impact. Interesting. Just, just an idea. I'm throwing it out. I like that better than negative impact. I like residual, yeah, residual. because some of it is um, legend <laughs> history. Some of it is past history that's being passed down to the younger generations in these stories that are coming out now. And the younger generations are feeling this now because of what they've been told. And that, to me, is a residual thing. Because it's not actually... Well, it, it, it shouldn't. It, it shouldn't. It, it shouldn't be happening to the young people today, right? By law, and if it is, we need to work on that too. But that's the whole other council that's going to do that. Well, and again, this Through gets to the. Mission. It got to, to something I started to say earlier. And cut myself off, but that idea that this is, while this is specifically. <coughs> For an event, right? The eugenics survey. It's more than that. We know that. And that's the point of the task force to form the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So this has been the tricky part for me is trying to figure out like what is in the apology and then what is in the next step and the next step. And I I want to be sensitive to the fact that the more steps we go down the line, we run the risk of not fulfilling. Mm -hmm. the next steps. I mean, that's just the nature of, that's the nature of our work sometimes. And I think we're trying to say that we are committed to making sure that the next step and the next step happen. Yeah. And so, the, so here it's like, but this still, what we heard from, from folks, and again, I think the hard part in our, in our committee work is that, um, we have been really doing some hard, hard work listening and being tested about what we think, you know, and how we think about it in order to get this right. Um, but again, this, 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 the, the, just the, the motivation for this language was to just make sure that what's written and is going to be in the books gets what we're getting what we're trying to get across. Um, Lisa? So um, it was discussed that we give the task of writing the apology to the, the task force, the Truth and Reconciliation Group. Um, and I, I still I, I um, don't understand all the factors behind having to pass this out this week. And um, have, we have not heard from the French Canadian population at all. Um, we've, they've been reached out to, and there's a society, and they haven't responded. The society is genealogical in nature. Um, right, I'm but we know from, those people are. We know, from, we know from Nancy Gallagher's book in particular that had the most, that had the most detailed information in it, but also the other pieces that we've shared. And also we know that French Canadian was also, uh, uh, It was specifically stated, yes. But it was also commonly used as a, just like, just like other derogatory terms were used for descriptions of, of natives. I just feel like we have heard from everybody else, have not heard from them. story would be any how different would their story be I don't know but like at the last minute we're hearing objections from the Native American community all of a sudden at the 11th hour last Friday before we left we had a little sit down from leadership and they said you know hey wait a minute the Native American population wants this this and this included but we have heard nothing, zero, from the actual French Canadian population. So that, to me, 
is a little concerning with rushing this through. And I just wanted to put that out there because yes. I know the majority opinion is not like, oh, you know, we need to wait on this. I'm not sensing that we're rushing anything through on this bill. We've taken six weeks so far on this bill. Well, I mean, I would echo that the process is a little weird. I mean, I thought we left last week, or, you know, the last week we were here, I thought the committee had come right. to a pretty strong consensus on the resolution. Mm -hmm. And then it does now feel like, you know, three days from crossover, all of a sudden we're engaged in the task of rewriting it. And I just felt like we had a consensus. We had, in a rare moment, we had 11 right. people all on the same page. Yeah. And then just something to kind of gets dropped on us after six weeks. And I know that you were expressing frustration on a separate bill when the chamber was here after the bill had been here for six weeks, and all of a sudden they come in with objections and the administration does the same thing. They wait on a bill and they wait and they wait and they wait, and then the last minute they come in and they go, oh, here are all these concerns we have. And now here we are with the same process here. It's frustrating for sure. May I just, as a point of information, a parliamentary procedure for you all of you to be aware that crossover does not impact this all as a, as a resolution. Right. Good to know. Just so you know, yeah. are Thank we aware you. of that? I don't offer that as a pro or a con, just mm -hmm. simply as an FYI. Thank you. <laughs> you didn't know that either? I suspected that was the case. Good to know. Because it's a resolution, it's not a bill. It's a resolution, so the right. crossover is immaterial to a resolution. It obviously affects the later you wait in the legislative yeah. session, the Senate will have less time to deal with it. Right. But in terms of crossover per se, you do not need a rules committee waiver to bring this up post crossover deadline. So does that less frustrate you, Representative Tom? Well, it depends on what we do with it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we continue working on it to make it the best it can be. But I'm not interested in delaying this unless the coronavirus stops our work. I'm not interested in waiting till January of next year when we may not be here to take this up. We've put too much time and energy and heart and soul into this, whether you believe in it or not. So, um, well, I don't think it's a matter of not believing in it. It is for some people. So. Some of us were the original sponsors of this bill. Right. I get that. I also get that sometimes, you know, when it gets really hard to come to the finish line on stuff, it's really hard to. to you know, to, to finish, you know, consensus was doesn't necessarily mean that everybody agreed to it. They've been arguing for stronger language for two or three weeks. So I'm not really all that concerned about dropping another paragraph and a half on, of words on people to try to understand. It should be a fast thinking process here. <coughs> Nor am I interested in rushing it out by, by the end of crossover, especially knowing full well that we can take a deep breath and we don't have to wait here until 9 o'clock on Friday night to finish it. What was the first part of the, what you just said? I, I miss that, that you're not interested in dropping another paragraph, meaning taking out something? No, dropping in. Dropping in another? No, no, no. That's not what I said. Okay, or that's well, not what I intended to say. No, what I, I intended to say is I'm not, I, I'm, I'm I'm not interested in dropping the bill. Oh, I don't think anybody's really asking you to drop the bill, no. At least well, it's been, right it's been expressed. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to express that. No, but you weren't the one who expressed okay. it. I just feel like maybe we need to do a little more. Well, I'm not sure where we're going to get with French Canadians because we have put it out there. We have asked for... Um, we have asked for participation and we have gotten an incredible amount of participation and listened really intently to the people who have come forward who were, who were very directly affected by this. Mm -hmm. um, that a French Canadian genealogical society hasn't responded yet is the only possible way of, of doing things is um, we can continue to reach out to them or reach out and find a way if you have an insight to where we can find folks then that that then bring them forward what about reaching out to UVM since they issued their own apology and this survey commenced there they must have 
some resources with the French Canadian community. And to me, to not take testimony from a French Canadian would be like saying we don't want to take testimony from the disabled community. <coughs> and we did. We went through great lengths to get testimony from all of the affected communities. And to not take testimony from one particular group, to me, is quite egregious. So. Um, so what Ron, about if you reaching look out at, to Ron, UVM? if you can look in, out to UVM to the folks that might have testified from us, um, from UVM's uh, office, whether it's the president's office or I, I believe we had someone who testified from UVM um, yes. early on. And so if we can reach out to him to find out if he has any folks that, that, that I would appreciate that. That would, that would be, that would make me feel better. And I'm not French Canadian, just for the record. <laughs> so what do we do with this language? Yeah, right. Right. Back around. Back to it. Yes. <laughs> Back to the task yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Could we have um, our council write up what we currently have so we can read it all in one point by point? And then maybe in the meantime, get one more testimony from someone from that community? Um, yeah. There is, um, is there other language that people, I mean, while we're talking about language, is there any language that people either wanted to strengthen or soften? So, yeah. a fair amount, Tommy and I had a conversation earlier today, and there was a, there was a fair amount of um, pushback, including from myself and from Tommy originally, and from John, um, about the term genocide. Um, so, uh, Tommy and I had a conversation, and we were talking about, I guess, he and I at least didn't have a problem with ethnocide. Uh, I think that's a descriptive word that works um, in connection with what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. But then we kind of went on and thought, started thinking a little bit deeper and thinking, well, you know, this was actually a cultural genocide. Mm -hmm. People weren't actually murdered, but these people lost their heritage. They lost their language. They lost their land. They lost their costuming. They lost so much as a result of this that it was, in fact, cultural genocide. So I, Tommy and I thought about presenting that to the committee to see what thoughts were about adding that language, since I was one of the individuals that uh, were opposed to genocide because, of, of, as Tommy has presented, the, uh, the literal translation of genocide is, uh, is a murder. Um, and you know, while that technically didn't take place, I guess, as far as it did uh, as, in, in Nazi Germany and, the, and box cars full of uh, uh, human beings going to gas chambers, but the culture that was lost as a result of this, and people hiding and not answering the door and not and being afraid of vehicles pulling into their driveway. And denying their own culture. Was cultural yeah. genocide, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, so that's what Tommy and I were speaking about earlier. Yeah. So I, I think at least the two of us would be in favor. I don't know exactly where we would put it, but the expressions ethnocide and cultural genocide. Mm. Lisa? Um, ethnocide really is cultural genocide. Um, I don't think the need to use the word genocide is warranted at all because the definition of ethnocide, it refers to the extermination of national culture. Um, so. so maybe we should, but I would argue maybe the other way, Lisa, people understand the word genocide, I think. Yeah, they so maybe killing. instead of drop ethnocide and say cultural genocide. No, because I no. won't go for that. Sorry, you can do whatever you want, but I'm, I'm just no, I think because that. people may not know what ethnocide means, but genocide they do understand. And, and I was um, looking things up as well, and, and in terms of the. Um, we got the, the undergrad thesis, and so I was looking into different scholars around, uh, and particularly around the word genocide, um, and that uh, I found a number of different scholars that are using um, the word cultural genocide to refer specifically to indigenous peoples and the governmental policies such as this that we are trying to 
acknowledge uh, in that it, it did exactly, the, the, scholar, the argument that the two of you are just sharing right now is the argument that I found in multiple scholars. Um, so I wanted to add that to the- Who would have thought? To the, to the conversation. There are scholars behind you. Oh, yeah, holy. Yeah. No, it won't go to our back, Mary. So if it were to be entertained as additional language, I guess then we would need to talk about where it might go. Michael? And I don't know if it belongs in the where as or result. I don't either. The third, that third whereas that you're, right? <laughs> oh, Mary, can you, can you pull oh. it up again? I'm sorry. Can you pull up the, um, what do you want, Michael? Oh, the, I'm just uh, thinking that if you <coughs> do want to include the term cultural genocide, maybe it belongs in that new clause, the new, the revised third clause, the clause that right now talks about voluntary consent that, yeah. Right here. Uh, the third whereas? Yeah, somewhere within there resulting in cultural genocide or something along that line? Well, oh, you also have in the resolve, the further legislative action, you have, you posted that alternative one and we can just change that to cultural genocide there. I'm not sure. Which in the new language, John? Yes. In, sorry, it's posted under my name, Mary. No, no, it's, it was, uh, it, uh, well, it, it's on the committee website now, that alternative thing that Michael... That I merged in last oh, week, happened. now ten, two weeks ago. Yes, option, op, optional resolve language is called. So... Yeah. It, it, oh, that one. Which is now in the text, at least as of the moment it is. The one that reads that the General Assembly recognizes that further legislative action should be taken to address this cultural de genocide and the continuing impact? Well, I, right, but it stops, yeah, it's okay. right? It stops at, when we discussed this a week and a half ago, we did, we stopped it at some point. We, we didn't include the, the last few words. Right, we, yeah, we, we were all uncomfortable with the genocide thing, but I think what Tommy and Chip are coming up with, and the other, you know, it's interesting for me from a disability perspective, it's like, okay, in cultural de genocide, I, I, I just don't know how to capture it all. But I think from the Abenaki perspective, it was cultural genocide. Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, and, as this is a number of groups, and for the poor and other people, it's like, well, you know, what, what? I, so, but I, I, I kind of like the, sort of where Chip and where you're all going and with it, so. And I'm just saying, like, how do we capture everybody in there? Mariana, then listen. So I'm wondering, on line 18 where it says, action should be taken to address the continuing impact of state-sanctioned ethnogenics policies and practices, it doesn't say ethnogenics. I'm not sure that's words. even a word. I'm sorry? I'm not sure if the word term ethnogenics is a word. Did you just somebody could, it was a word? I didn't. I, I don't, I'm not, not sure if somebody could look it up and double check on me. I said ethnocide. Oh, ethnocide. I'm no. sorry. Well, I would assume you want to leave the word okay, eugenics in there, whatever you okay. use. That's the yes. base term. No, no, no. That, yeah. I, I actually, it, 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 is is a, it is a word. Ethnogenics? Ethnogenics is See, a word. That would be, but it's more a, a, a study. I think it's dealing more with a scholarly <coughs> yeah, study, study and uh, not in a negative oh, yeah. study of ethnic groups. I was trying. Yeah, you. Good word. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, what were you saying about the, uh, so I could understand what you were saying, were you saying that with Chip and Tommy before that that is the more current way of uh, talking about this, is to say culturally uh, genocide? Um, that is what I found uh, different scholars specifically looking at indigenous populations. Yeah, and, okay. Um, and so that the, um, uh, and it, it goes beyond the government policies of eugenics, but um, in terms of 
taking uh, children away from families for the express purpose of um, erasing culture and right. um, and uh, you know prohibiting religious practices and prohibiting language use. So the the whole suite of governmental practices to systematically eliminate culture. Yeah. Um, and so that that term cultural genocide is is uh, in in scholarship, but specifically around indigenous people. So it doesn't address the um, the issues of disability and folks that are impoverished, and and then um, yeah. So it would cover French Canadians, though, as far as what you're saying is yeah, the I mean, definition. Yeah, I mean, it so could be. It could be. Yeah, in terms of disallowing language, in in right. terms of disallowing uh, religious practices. Right. Um, uh, I, I don't know what the rates of uh, removing children from French Canadian households were um, in Vermont, uh, but that that was a, a practice that happened in Vermont for indigenous folks and, and across the U.S. Um, so, Lisa. Um, so I had a couple of comments, but the only one I'm going to make at this point is that <clears throat> this may not be the end-all and be-all of resolutions in terms of this eugenics survey. The Truth and Reconciliation Council may come up with something much more specific than, and want to do a different resolution than a more involved one. I think we're getting pretty deep into this. On the optional resolve language, I'm just throwing this out because it seems to cover more iterations, like John's concerned about the poor and uh, um, disabled that we mentioned earlier. So it, we have where it says uh, state sanctioned eugenics policies related practices of disenfranchisement. And this would, it, it gets kind of lengthy, but it, I think it addresses more and whatever. Um, so we have disenfranchisement, and then we could say, and individual, family, community, and cultural destruction, which I, could, I think then between family, community, and cultural, we cover all of the groups that we've mentioned before. I just, it may be too clunky. It may not, I don't know, but just. Could we throw religious in there, too? Because some of the persecution against French Canadians was because of their Catholic religion. I. Sure, I thought that would have been covered potentially under cultural, but um, mm, culture is a little different than religion. But I like the word destruction because that doesn't necessarily mean murder to me. It has a slightly different connotation than genocide. Yes, but it could include genocide. Could you read again, please? After disenfranchisement. Disen dis disenfranchisement and individual, family, community, and cultural destruction, and maybe religious in there as well. It's, it's a longer way to enumerate much of what's covered by cultural genocide, but it also includes some things that aren't covered by the term cultural genocide, i.e. the poor and the disabled. Mm -hmm. But. significantly weakens the language. I think it brings it more back to where we were the Friday we left here. I'm not sure I agree with that. Or I guess before we heard from Representative Tolino, which only some people heard from him. Lisa, if you'd like to hear more from Representative Tulina, I'll be happy to set up an appointment. And he can relate exactly what he related to us, which I believe I related back to you. That's, that's fine. That's, Is that a yes? Uh, no. I, I read what you wrote to us, and I was half in the room and half out when he was speaking. I didn't know that it was a group conversation. I thought it was a private conversation he was having, so I was trying not to listen. Um, basic rule of thumb when the door is open, it's an open conversation. I, I agree. Mm -hmm. 
So just, I mean, just a quick question, though. I mean, I mean, this is more, I don't know, it's a philosophical question. Is, is the, is the uh, distaste for the words that end in I-D-E or C-I-D-E, is that what it is? Is it, is it just really hard to, to accept that that's what we did? Or is it just the words, are the words too ugly? No, I, I suggest an ethnocide, which ends in C-I-D-E, as opposed to genocide, which I feel invokes the image of mass killing, as Tommy pointed out in your well-written email to us, which I agreed with. But it's cultural. Cultural ethnocide, then. It's hard work, folks, I get it. And it's okay if we all don't agree. Some of us will vote for it, some will vote against it. But we were all in consensus when we were leaving here on Thursday. I'm not gonna say Friday, but Thursday, because Mariana wasn't here Friday. <clears throat> I heard um, a, a potential next step of um, in incorporating the um, some changes. So, Lisa, you asked for kind of a clean, incorporated copy um, to then look look through. Um, I think it's the um, what what I'm hearing the sticking point on right now of if we. It, uh, include the the word cultural um, genocide in in this language, and it it might be we have some um, potential locations for that phrase, uh, but it's not something that we are are seeing written out, uh, which is generally helpful for for um, for us to be able to see where the language is instead of just talk through it, um, and. And then I also heard the next step of um, continual reach out uh, to French Canadian folks that we, we have done multiple reach outs already and not gotten any interest in coming to testify. And, um, and hearing that the chair is willing to, to, uh, to continue to reach out um, to, to see if we can get somebody from that group to testify. So those are the, the next steps that I have heard us agree on. Um, in our competition. Mm -hmm. So for Michael, yeah. what are we ta what are we tasking Michael with? <laughs> right. To words to take to take the language that was provided under my name now on the website. Could I and wordsmith that into the? Yeah. Could I under Could we scroll? I don't have a, a an mean? iPad or not. I understand it's on the website, so I just want to make sure that I understand my directions before I leave this room. And my understanding is that for the moment, and I know everything's for the moment, the first two whereas clauses stay as they are. And then the new language that you had for whereas clauses would become the new three and the second one effectively the new four because part of that is already there and I would merge it together and then there would be a new second resolve clause based upon the language uh, but based upon both what's there and the language that was suggested and somewhere in there I need to get the term cultural genocide and I'd like some direction where you want me to put that. I think we're where we're agreed to right now is that is that or ethnocide? I'm not, I'm not ethnocide sure. Ethnocide seems to be one step forward on those out of those two, um, and and then if Randall, if you can provide perhaps, uh, I mean everything's still in play because we're still working on this, right? So if Randall can send you his language that that changed the additional language that you have presented. So we're talking about for the for the language 
that Representative uh, Zott's looking at, we're t talking about the second resolve clause, not a whereas clause. Uh, I was working off of the optional resolve. Which is now the second resolve in the text. Yeah. What I'm now calling the second resolve, and which uh, the gentleman who submitted the document, he also was effectively modifying what's now the second resolve. And if that's what you're doing, that's fine. I will incorporate your language as the second resolve, as the new second resolve which is based in part on what's already there, but expands it, obviously. All right, and then there was some wordsmithing to be done about the harmed and harmed and harmed. Yeah, and right, to make sure that I didn't use the word harm twice within three words of each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then... Um, <clears throat> we talked, there was a talk about negative, uh, continue, residually impacted or something to that nature. So most of what I want is on the website with the exception that Representative Zott needs to send me an email so that I see the, the balance. Yes, and I sent you an email with the link to the article that is also on our website from Mercedes to Guardiola, and I gave you the page number where I found the quote of her essay. In her, Professor in her essay, yes. So I'll take out the cell call and I'll put in the Professor Perkins reference. Yep. What is your timeline? Um, Thursday. Sometime on Thursday. And obviously I will. And that's Thursday to check in. I mean, we're just going to keep checking in on these Well, I certainly, I certainly can have all those changes made for Thursday. That's, that would be and once I have them edited, I can send them to, uh, we have to. We can load them up. Into we the have system. to schedule Thursday and Friday. I've left those open simply because of the rolling nature of all of the different things that we're working on. Um, so but I will assume that it's going to be ready in time if you decide you want to do this at the top of the morning on Thursday. So then that's good for me. So then if I see you're not going to see me till three in the afternoon, no harm done. I already have everything set. Great. So I'm going to try, if possible, to get this to run by the end of the day tomorrow, which would make life even simpler so that all of you could have a chance Wednesday night to see what I've done. Great. I'm not promising that, but I'll make every effort to make that happen. Thank you. Uh, there was two questions from the last meeting in this committee, and I have not done a new version of the bill, so it's the same version you saw previously. But there's one question. Uh, looking at the bill itself, You'll notice that 9 BSA 4502 is amended, but in that subsection of that statute, it does not include as a protected category uh, persons with disabilities. And someone had asked, well, how come? And the answer is that in text you don't see in the bill, in subsection B of the same statute, it does deal with uh, people with disabilities. So it's simply how the bill looks. You don't see the full statute, but that statute does address people with disabilities. So that was one question. And uh, another question was raised, if you remember, you heard testimony from uh, an attorney who's experienced with employment-related law, and he suggested adding some language, which the committee certainly could do if it wants. Um, I was not asked to add it in, so I did not. But um, I think there were some questions, <clears throat> which maybe I can help answer, and other uh, witnesses in the room could help answer, which is, what happens if someone is a member of a protected category? Can they still have an adverse employment action taken against them for a legitimate reason? And the scenario that was discussed last time was if you pass this bill and homeless people are now a protected category, if they're employed by a business, but they're continually late, what could the business, if anything, do? Could they take an adverse action? Could they discipline that person for being tardy? or even perhaps fire them. And the answer is that under current law, any of the protective categories, you can take a legitimate adverse employment action against an individual for legitimate reason. Um, and you could do that, I believe, if you add housing status to these anti-discrimination provisions. If you want to add some of the language that Stephen Ellis suggested, you could certainly do that. But I don't know if it's necessary to do that. Uh, what would happen under 
current law, and I believe would also happen if you add housing status to any of these statutes that you're looking at, is that someone who believes that they've been discriminated against would make a prima facie case. So they go in the ledge that I was, let's say they're fired, I was fired uh, for being homeless. And if that is so, they would have to allege that um, that they're a member of a protected class, that they otherwise they were qualified for the job, that they were subjected to an adverse employment action, and that the employer had treated a similarly situated individual uh, outside that person's protected class in a different manner. So that would be a prima facie case. If they can allege that, which is a very cert, uh, basic showing, so it's sort of making the first showing, then the plaintiff, the employer, would have the burden of showing that they can articulate a legitimate reason for that action to have been taken. So in the scenario that was given, they would have to articulate that the person was fired not because they're homeless, but because they were late continually. You know, they were late 10 times in two weeks, or whatever it was. They'd have to articulate a legitimate business reason for the adverse action that was taken. If the employer can do that, then the burden shifts back to the person suing, the employee, to show that that is merely a pretext, that they weren't really fired because they were late, they were really fired because they were homeless or a member of a protected class. So this ties into something we talked about before, which in any of these situations, it would be fact dependent and case specific. In other words, it would be up for the Human Rights Commission, or the courts to weigh if indeed it was a pretext or not. So those are some of the issues that have been left hanging the last time I was here. Did I answer those questions sufficiently? Are there any follow-up questions I can answer at this point? Yes, you answered my question about the disability. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm still a little puzzled. In terms of, I understand what the burden of proof is in, in proving a, a discriminatory case, but if someone's living in their car and they are continuously late because of that, isn't their homeless situation causing that to be terminated from their job? And isn't there a connection there? Well, there might be a connection, but I think the employer can take action against someone for legitimate employment right. related right. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I understand criteria that. factor, yeah. regardless of the root cause. I think this always gets into who's made the prima facie case, uh, what's the evidence, I and then, of course, whether it's a pretext. Yeah. So yeah. I can't really answer yeah. more specifically than that because it depends on the facts of the case and right. what kind of evidence you have and you know what what could be established. So I, and I'm you should sure. hear from other witnesses sure. also to see if uh, <laughs> okay. what I summarize is accurate. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? So anyone else recall any other questions from the week before? There was one that was brought up by the Grocers Association that had to do with job applications and the notion that if you cannot, that you need an address in order to fill out an application. And I forgot to follow up on that, I'm sorry. I think that was discussed in testimony. This bill's been around for a while. It may not have been last year, it may have been acquired by any of I think that issue was discussed and I thought for some reason that if you had a reasonable address, it might be sufficient. I did not follow up on that, so I can try to do so, but I didn't check on that. Um, I think that was tax information. What's that? <clears throat> I was just thinking about like tax, tax. information and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, this goes beyond, I mean, we don't have a special, there are some municipalities or states that are starting to do identifications for homeless people that are giving them a, uh, we're not doing that. We're not, you know, people can get an ID yeah, card, yeah. but they, they, if they can qualify, if they can prove that they, that they can get one somehow. But um, we're not issuing specific 
legal identification. No, 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 I understand that. But we're talking, like, like Chip, uh, Chip was pointing out, and we were just discussing with the, with the address component, you know, needing that for documentation, for the paperwork, for the application process. Still need that for their HR paperwork for submitting your payroll company or your payroll provider for tax purposes. So, so that's, that, a, yeah. that's just a, if you can look that up, I'll do my best. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, do you hire, have you hired a homeless person? I hire or a person I without an address? Well, I work, I work with John Graham Housing Services for years to get people back into the workforce. It's always the John Graham address. Right. You know what I mean? And is that sufficient? Well, no, it's totally sufficient. But what I'm saying is if this, you know, sort of car scenario that we're painting a picture of with, like, the person living in it, are they late? Is that a term? You know, what does that do to the address component? of like mandatory filing paperwork with the federal government. You know, like yeah, a, how did you, how did people at the John Graham house deal with it? The they person was living there, they, they were living in the car. That's what, now I'm saying me as the employer, like if the individual was living in the car with this scenario that was just- Right, I mean the goal, the goal ho hopefully would be that if someone had a job, Totally they agree, but it's still a place to live. Yeah, but you got to start with that at that start right. point. You still have to figure out, you, you know, you still got to file the W's when you hire. Yep. So, like, what are you putting on that line on the W's if they're living in a Camry? Well, it could yeah. be a friend's house. It could Street. be a, you know, <laughs> let's um, see. No, no, I'm just curious. Yeah, like, what's the, like, yeah. legit answer? And a post-tax number is not considered. All right, committee, can I get a temperature check on this? Are we, are, are we like, I'm not going to, are we ready to find a consensus, to use the word from earlier today, um, on this bill? And try, it doesn't mean you have to vote for it. It doesn't mean you have to, you, you, I'm just getting a temperature check. Have we gone over the language sufficiently? To the point where we can put this on the t when 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 the attorney comes back with further information, if that's answered satisfactorily to our to you know to get us to the next level, is the next level um, voting on this bill? Whether it's you know it's, it's not going to be today, obviously, <coughs> but whether it's Thursday or Friday. Yes, Lisa. Um, I still have notes like about um, public disturbances. In, and people interacting, or law enforcement interacting with mm -hmm. homeless folks. Um, and I don't know that we've really heard from very many law enforcement, if any. I, I can't go back that far that quickly. Nope. And um, <clears throat> the address, the employment addre address for an employment application, that concerns me because I think that's a federal law, but I'm not certain about that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I still have some unanswered questions, yes. Okay. Um, as far as the police, they've been invited. We've invited a couple of different representatives from uh, public safety and have gotten no's for answers um, specifically. Um, Do we know why they don't want to testify? They didn't need to say. They just said no. Okay. Um, so that probably answers part of my question. And okay. then... Um, so I think, Luke, I think we're done with you for today. Do you need me to hang out or can I run to another committee? Uh, you can. Well, could I ask before the police? Deanna, are you still in the room? I am. Uh, I know you had talked about the public accommodation and the town came up with kind of a bridging thing. And I just want to make sure, are you comfortable with uh, where the language now stands with that issue you raised earlier? This is uh, some weeks ago. Um, Right, that was some weeks ago. Um, so I just remember what the specific. Yeah, the specific was wanting um, public accommodations as our language, so that it wasn't a new category of carve out. Uh, was the um, so that was with the accommodate accommodations to spaces hybrid that we were discussing. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you're good. Um, well, um, maybe that question is to you, Luke, because I missed some of the testimony um, Luke sure. Fort left in terms of where that end, end of landing. If you go to, so this is on the draft that's number three, 
right. and the upper left hand corner says 2 2020 in my initials LM. If you look at that draft, which is what I think the one we looked at last time, mm -hmm. if you go to page three, so this is only a section of the building with the so-called homeless bill of rights. It's mm -hmm. not the amendments to Title IX later and the other stuff. Right. You'll see C in line 11. This is the language that the committee wanted put in. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it, you will see one has public place or two, a place of public accommodation mm -hmm. with the consent of the owner or other person representing the place, page three, and in a manner that does not interfere. So that was the yeah. new language yeah. in the latest draft that was trying to accomplish what the committee had wanted mm -hmm. to achieve. Yeah, I think that, um, uh, it feels like a, a little over explaining of the um, <laughs> of uh, what we have talked about is already in law in terms of not interrupting normal business operations but that was always my my intent around um, public accommodations and so I think it so line 16 is good yeah uh, yeah so I think that's that then that works for me okay good okay and I, I think the bill works for me at present. Tom, if you're asking us a temperature check. Thank you, John. Um, I guess while I still, do you have a place to run to? I do, but I'm perfectly fine to hang out here. If it's okay. It's, of course, it's okay. okay. I would just like to see. I I just like to see folks who there are a couple of folks who've been in the room from the beginning. Sure. Um, if I'm just if they have any further comments, the floor is open. Bor, do you have any further comments on this or? I think Luke did a really great job of explaining <laughs> discrimination law in the prima facie case. And um, the unfortunate answer is it, it, to answer your question about if someone is late all the time because they are homeless, how do we address that? Well, it really just, it's hard and it's, yep. it depends. And we, are, we often deal with that with um, disability issues where, particularly psychiatric disabilities, where someone might be late because of psychiatric disability and um, for the most part if a, an employer is firing someone or disciplining someone because of being late that is a legitimate non-discriminatory reason and uh, discrimination cases are really hard to win because anyone the respondents can come up with any legitimate non-discriminatory reason and oftentimes those are upheld so if there's a concern that we are taking rights away from employers here, that's not, just not going to happen. That's, that's what I would say. Employers maintain all of their rights, and they often defeat a lot of employment discrimination cases. So. Well, I understand the concept of prima facie, so yeah. you know, I understand that, and, but yeah. it's just not quite going to get out of my head. Well, and it's it's hard, and I yeah. think. Um, I, mean, I heard of a person being terminated from a mental health agency yeah. because they were living in their car and uh, they couldn't get to work and they couldn't get there clean. And if you had an employer who was allowing some employees to come to work late uh -huh. because of kids, uh -huh. or because um, they have other committees that they have to go to, mm -hmm. but someone who is not allowed to come in late because they are living in their car, then the only difference you have there is yeah. the fact that they are homeless, yeah. and in that case, it isn't a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. Yeah. yeah. Earhart? Uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to comment again. Earhart Monko with the Montville Housing Coalition. So I came in late um, dealing with emergency housing uh, issue next door and appropriations. Um, I understand, I'm just looking at it, I'm understanding from uh, Luke that really this has remained unchanged from the last draft that um, you saw just before the break, which we were fine with. Uh, we like uh, Representative Waltz's suggestion uh, around the place, uh, public place, and um, and uh, place of accom uh, public accommodation, and that, that compromise. And uh, I don't know if uh, I don't think the ACLU is in the room, but I know from talking to Falco Schilling um, from the ACLU uh, that they were fine with that uh, with that like wording as well. So um, we're we're good to go, mm -hmm. and hope you guys can pass this bill out before crossover. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay. Um, yeah. We will see if we can get you for Thursday or Friday morning. 
Sure. And so the only takeaway I have is the question about the forms and what kind of address would need to be in the forms. Is that accurate? Is that right? Yeah, like what would be sufficient for yeah. filling those fields legally with the federal government, the IRS. Yeah. Lisa? Are there any attorneys in Legislative Council who deal with law enforcement who would be able to answer questions about that? Um, that's my background. I don't do judiciary anymore, but that's also you know, Eric and Michelle and Bryn. I think you're asking a little more of a policy question. It sounded to me. I would glad to talk to you offline and see if there's a legal question and we can come and try to answer that. Yeah. But it sounded a little more of it's the impact of the bill. case by case type yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I can talk to you outside the committee room and see if we can help out. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.